I'd like to call to order the October 10th, 2018 meeting of the Southboro School Committee. As usual, we'll start with audience sharing. But unusually, we actually have some. We do. We have a front row. Um, our, our finest in blue here tonight. And um, over the weekend, Chief Paulus uh, sent an Instagram or a Facebook uh, photo out uh, of a very celebratory moment with um, Officer Aaron Richardson just being um, newly graduated, I guess, from his D.A.R.E. program. And as we talked about last year, we've expanded D.A.R.E. into the middle school. It's been something that has been up for conversation for some time. And um, working in collaboration with the officer team, and certainly Keith, um, always mindful of opportunities for students in the middle school to grow uh, academically and as um, good citizens. Um, this was a great opportunity to, uh, to move forward with that initiative. Everyone's familiar with very familiar with <laughs> Office of Landry. And so um, thought that this might be a way to celebrate not only um, your success and your um, addition to our school community, which has already been phenomenal, um, and the great work that Keith is doing up at Trottier, but um, also to thank Chief Paulus again for just being such a supporter, a great supporter of our schools, um, not only in this, but in so many other ways throughout the year. Uh, Kevin's just a regular. We, he comes and you know he shows up in the cruiser now. So like, oh hi, where's your office? Here's your coffee. So we're happy that we've been able to move forward with this program, and um, we've made three chairs here at the table. If you want to come up and join us, if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> if I may, I'd just like to speak quickly. I have a building committee. Uh, meeting to attend so I'll just say a few words and then I'll head over there so I know since I got here in uh, 2014 we have had some discussions about expanding the DARE program I think very important in this day and age to carry it over into the middle school community and uh, we we're finally able to make that happen this year and uh, working with Superintendent Johnson Assistant Superintendent Martineau uh, we we're able to find some funding and uh, also thanks to the town who has increased our staffing at the police station a bit um, in the last few years so we're able to uh, take an officer and have him uh, have some added responsibilities over at the uh, in the DARE program so uh, very proud to have Officer Richardson accept the position um, I believe he's going to be taking over Kevin's old slot in fifth grade and then Kevin will be expanding into the seventh grade curriculum um, just something also we're just trying to expand slowly into our presence at the other schools on at Woodward we have a Wednesday program going on right now we'll, we'll get a lot of different offices hopefully in there at least one day a week and maybe we can expand that a little further into some of the other schools as we move on um, something I want to follow up on you'll all see officer Richardson uh, he's hugely popular in the community and he's a fantastic choice um, he hasn't even taught a dare class yet. He set our record for likes on, on a Facebook post. Uh, uh, I guess that means a lot. I'm like Bill Belichick. I'm a, I'm a my face guy. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but um, uh, that being said, you're going to really enjoy him. And uh, I'll leave it over to them for a little more of an introduction. Um, so we not only wanted to introduce Aaron, um, I asked Kevin to come along with us this evening and he had some family commitments and I kind of insisted that he be here. And that was more to recognize he has been the face of the police department and the schools in this community for 18 years? 18 years. 18 years. And he'll be remembered more than any of the department combined for you know everybody that grew up in Southboro and uh, you know the last 18 years and moving forward so I would like to personally recognize him on behalf of the department and give him an applause <laughs> so without further ado I'm gonna leave for my building committee meeting and turn it over to these officers and maybe they can give you a little more information about the program and thanks for having us thanks for being Okay, put on the spot. Uh, I, I just want to say thank you very much for allowing us to, to come here. Uh, I have been teaching uh, DARE now for 18 years. Uh, I've been a member of the Southport Police Department for 20 years. And one of the first things I tell the, the kids um, on the very first day that I, I go in and meet them, 
is that I tell them how proud I am to be a DARE officer because I sat in the chair that they were sitting in uh, when I grew up here in Southboro. So I tell them I take uh, tremendous pride in being able to come to a school I actually sat in um, in the chairs that where they are. So um, I, hopefully that, that kind of uh, helps them realize that, hey, there's a, there was a police officer that sat in the same chair I did back when I was in fifth grade. So it kind of gives them a, a little bit of uh, connection there. Um, over the years, uh, the D.A.R.E. curriculum has, has changed um, probably about four times. Uh, clearly, as uh, teach, teaching methods uh, uh, evolved, so has the D.A.R.E. program. And, and I wanted to thank uh, the, the principals here in town for allowing us to come into some pretty um, uh, busy and uh, jam-packed schedules. Uh, and you've always been very flexible to me and uh, very accommodating to me. So uh, that's certainly something I appreciate from the superintendent's office on down. So um, I will continue to, uh, as I put it to the kids, uh, I'll keep doing this until they tell me to stop. Um, and uh, now that I have uh, a, a, a co-worker with me um, uh, getting on board, I just think uh, of nothing but nice things in the future to, to happen. You're allowed to speak. I, he, I told him he can't speak until I, I tell him to. <laughs> Kevin's been a great mentor of mine uh, since I got here. A lot of the community policing things that I do, I learned from him. Um, I'm just very grateful to be uh, selected for this role. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge role. I was crammed in my head for the last two weeks that now I carry two badges. Um, I represent uh, the DARE program, DARE America, and the town of Southboro as well. Um, it wasn't an easy two weeks. It's probably the hardest training I've been to since the police academy. Um, I think I called Kevin the first night and I was like, no, I think I'm all set for this. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think this is for me. Um, but at, now, I graduate the program. I, I can't see myself doing anything else. Uh, it was very hard. It was 45-minute uh, presentations every day, uh, two hours of homework on top of my hour and 40-minute drive home uh, from Concord, New Hampshire, and then getting up at 4.30 in the morning to go back. Um, it's, it's not easy. So every DARE officer that is selected, they all care, and it's not something that's given. You don't just show up to the training and you graduate. You actually have to earn it. So every police officer that you come in contact that is a DARE officer, they are very dedicated to the program. So I know Kevin's been dedicated for 18 years, and I'm going to try to fill his big shoes, and you will get a dedicated DARE officer as well as a police officer. I take very strongly in uh, working in the schools. Kathleen has been absolutely amazing to me. Uh, she lets me come in once a week and have lunch with the kids and go to recess and it's just been it's been great. Um, I think from the day of program as well I've become a better parent uh, in the two weeks. Um, I, I hope. Uh, so I really appreciate it. I thanked uh, Miss Johnson yesterday and I, I can't be more thankful to the rest of you for allowing me to be in this uh, role. So it's from the bottom of my heart sincerely I thank you guys and Kevin being such a great mentor. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just add one thing about Officer Harrington? So um, today, um, Kevin came in as part of our lunch program, and um, I, I looked over, and he had a group of students all around him, and um, I asked what he was doing. He was signing his business cards and handing them out as um, like autographs to the <laughs> students. <laughs> uh, yeah. so and at one point, the student says, this is his number. I can call him. I said, Kevin, I don't think you want to be giving that out. <laughs> so, um, I'm sure that that type of relationship will develop with you, too, Officer, um, officer uh, Richardson. Um, I also want to recognize the efforts of Chief Paulus, who has been part of um, creating this lunch program at Woodward. And uh, it's been nothing but successful um, in the first month that we've um, started it. So thank you. I just want to say again, thank you. It's so much a part of our school readiness program, um, you know, instilling in students the importance of working together and, and also, um, you know, just the, the phenomenal role models that you have for our students in building such a positive school culture, a, a culture of acceptance and safety. Um, to Kevin, um, Officer Landry, you know, it, it's hard to believe it was seven years ago, uh, but Kevin has played such a pivotal role in um, establishing, I guess, and participating in the very first chapter of our Alice work. Um, he readily volunteered to go uh, for training, which was not on anyone's you know, schedule of to-dos for um, Officer Landry at the time, and really worked um, over and above 
in collaboration with Northborough and the two chiefs at the time to establish our new uh, safety protocols. And this was all above and beyond what he does as an officer in the community and also as a DARE officer. So it's been, we appreciate everything. Wow. I'm sure you have an outstanding uh, history, uh, uh, history with Officer <coughs> Landry and a future uh, as a DARE officer as well in our school. So welcome. We're glad to have you with us. Big shoes and foot comment again. <laughs> and thanks again to the uh, principals for being such a, such a partner in getting these programs Thank you. Uh, delivered Thank you. to our students in such a positive way. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for having us tonight. We'll thank you. Do thanks for being here, and thanks for sticking with it for two weeks and, and getting it done. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and with that, we'll move on to new business, and the first item is the Woodward School Improvement Plan. This is Steve uh, Pesmamucci's first improvement right. plan. It is. Exactly. Gave updates last year with um, in regards to the uh, second year of the two-year plan, uh, but this is the, the first plan that I've been um, a part of creating. So as I came to Southboro, um, through many conversations I had with the school community, with our parent groups, um, with uh, Superintendent Johnson and um, Assistant Superintendent Marno and, and my colleagues here. Um, what I kept hearing was it, it's a supportive community, but you also need to get to know the community. So that was a large part of my work last year, um, really building connections and creating relationships with um, all the different organizations that can, that can lend support to the schools. Um, in looking at um, how we would be moving as far as a building, um, what we started to focus on first was the mission statement. Um, and that was really what was guiding our work. Um, it is the mission of the Woodward School to maximize academic achievement, social responsibility, and lifelong learning by attending to the intellectual and developmental needs of individual students in supportive classroom environments. Now there's three key components to this um, that stood out to myself and staff in reviewing this. Those being the academic achievement, social responsibility, and lifelong learning. So those were kind of guiding um, themes as we work towards creating our um, school improvement plan goals. Um, but you know, with, with any good, um, any good plan, you, you have to reflect back and look on the work that you've that you've done in the past, and um, so that you can continue to build on those things. Um, so I just wanted to highlight um, some of the elements of the five goals that were part of the 2016-18 plan. Um, the first being um, the communication and, and getting to know stakeholders and, and developing those partnerships early on. Um, a lot of that work was done by my predecessor, but that was very important to me as I took on the role. Um, one, uh, one of the first things that I, that I had done was surveyed stakeholders, um, started having principal coffees regularly, um, looking at topics such as curriculum, um, mathematical thinking, growth mindset, and reviewing MCAS, um, developing relationships with parents um, at an early stage in the year so that I could um, get a better sense of where they thought the direction um, or what they would like to see the direction of the building move towards. Um, I feel like it was very important to survey them as stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> as far as um, communication, uh, excuse me, curriculum instruction and assessment, um, we continue to develop our curriculum maps, um, continue the rollout of the second year of our Carolina Science units, um, and then started um, the grade level collaboration with uh, more of a focus on data analysis. That was some of the professional development that I um, worked with staff on last year, working with our um, newly hired uh, K-5 to math curriculum coordinator looking at um, student work and then determining how best um, to support them um, moving forward. Um, we provided professional development to staff in the areas of science, um, mathematics, <clears throat> some social emotional learning that took place early on in the year with work with Jessica Minahan. Um, goal four, um, looking at student support services. <clears throat> um, a major part of, of um, uh, overall student performance is healthy body, healthy minds. So we focus some of our energies on um, de further developing programs like Wake Up and Work Out, um, our green team recycling program um, with an emphasis on nutrition. We looked at um, creating a walking school bus that was pretty successful last year um, and, and you know, continues to grow this year. And the social emotional learning um, was very important to us. Finally, <clears throat> goal five, um, looking at the 21st century learning and technology integration. Um, there's a, 
you know, when we, when we look at this, we think tech first, but it's also the idea of thinking critically, um, having stu giving students tools so that they can work in collaborative groups, so that they can problem solve, and so that they can um, question things and develop uh, better practices or ways of doing things in the future. Um, we are very proud of a one-to-one -one tech integration um, device to students. And um, we'll be continuing to um, review and, and analyze those um, technology needs of our building um, when we develop our, our budgets moving forward. So after thinking about where we've been, um, the next stage was setting the course. How are we going to be moving forward as a building? And um, what are going to be the process we use in developing our goals? Um, so the first thing that I had done was um, worked with staff, uh, again, getting to know them, um, having them reflect on the school improvement plan, um, talking about dis district initiatives and uh, school goals, and then taking stock. Where were we? Um, you know, having them progress monitor and then also come up with action steps on their own that they felt um, was a, a way to continue a plan that was currently in progress. Um, so to that end, we did um, continue to develop some of those goals, especially around PBIS and um, uh, using some of those um, uh, expected behavior videos that we had talked about. That was one piece that was still there and still kind of hanging and we wanted to um, see that goal accomplished. So that was one thing that we continued to work for, towards. Um, we then used team leader meetings and grade level collaboration um, and really talked about creating a, a focus and what were those building priorities that the staff were invested in. Um, this is not a plan that I wanted to create and, and provide to staff, but rather they needed to be a part of the creation of it. Um, from that point, um, I worked with, uh, again, surveying stakeholders um, during principal coffees after delivering a topic or, or information around something. Um, I would then use that time afterwards to talk to parents, to figure out what were those topics that they would like to see um, discussed further or um, what they felt were pressing issues that needed to be addressed at the school level. Um, taking all of that information, um, then I worked with up my school council to um, set priorities and talk about a vision for what our building um, a vision, vision for our building moving forward. Um, finally, we drafted and reviewed our school improvement plan goals. Um, there were several reviews and edits to those along the way, but we feel very strongly that these um, address those three uh, mission statement priorities. <clears throat> so where are we going? So th this is the, the portion where um, I wanted to identify those three goals, um, highlight some of the areas of those goals, and um, certainly take questions along the way or at the end um, if uh, whatever you know you um, however you see fit um, the first piece the first goal um, has to do with the the component of social responsibility in our mission statement um, so the woodward school will support students in acquiring the skills necessary to recognize and manage their emotions and behavior demonstrate empathy for others and thoughtfully navigate challenging social situations through social curricula and best instructional practices um, so here are just five um, of the action steps or processes that we plan on taking. Um, for open circle collaboration, um, open circle is not new to the district, but we've had new staff come in. Um, there are new resources that are developed. There are new components of the curriculum that staff need to be trained on. Um, this, the calibration piece would make sure that all of our staff um, are delivering the same message with the same resources. Um, it's also important to step back and say, is the open circle curriculum, is it meeting the needs of our students? Um, needs of students change over time um, and we want to make sure that the, the, the program continues to do that and to, to meet our students needs. Um, again I talked about PBIS um, enhancements and this is kind of a tricky one for me because um, when I came on board last year I wanted to make progress in some of those areas um, laying groundwork but also realizing that these goals are not come that there's still more work to be done around um, PBIS. So we're working on creating um, uh, behavioral reflections and accountability practices, uh, making sure that there's consistent language used throughout the building and in different areas um, and with different staff members. Um, we found that consistency has to be there um, as students move from specialists to classroom teachers um, or some of that message can get a little um, uh, distorted. We'll also be analyzing our current training and practices around executive functioning. Um, and providing, making sure that um, that executive um, functioning teaching and learning is taking place um, for students and then how do we um, embed that into teachers and instructional practices. Do they need professional development in this area and um, are they 
are they able to um, uh, kind of demonstrate and model what those expected behaviors are um, of our students. Um, around community partnerships, um, as we talked about before with um, Southboro Police Department, we're um, always continuing to strengthen those partnerships with Southboro Youth and Family Services, with Family Success Partnership, um, as well as community organizations, and um, even, even things like Extended Day. Um, how can we work with those groups to um, create a, a positive learning environment or a positive home experience for students so that they can be um, accessible to learning uh, when they're here with us at school. Um, we're also looking at tiered behavioral supports. Um, that really comes down to developing systematic approach to um, dealing with challenging behaviors or providing support to students who may um, be having difficult times. Um, that moves from whole group lessons around open circle um, to small group such as lunch bunch or social thinking groups and then down to one-on-one um, -on -one intervention or support. Our second goal, <clears throat> this um, center around, centers around academic achievement. Um, the Woodward School will expand upon and refine our data analysis at the classroom, grade, and school level to respond to the diverse learning needs of our students and to drive instruction. Um, so while this is student-centered, student-focused, um, it's around data analysis and improvement, um, a big part of this or a big piece of this is um, staff development, making sure that they feel they um, have the tools necessary to analyze the data and to um, work in collaborative groups so that they can best meet the needs of our students. Um, a few components of that, we're looking to refine our um, response intervention documentation and intervention systems. Um, we're lo looking to um, design schedules that support flexible student grouping, um, helping students with some skill deficits, but also identifying those students who um, can, can benefit from accelerated learning opportunities. Um, we're looking, uh, we're continuing to um, assess, uh, analyze assessments at the local state level um, through our BBST teams, through our um, lead teacher teams and grade level teams and then developing strategies to close those achievement gaps. Um, as far as curriculum calibration, it's important that um, through working with our literacy specialists or math curriculum coordinators that we're developing a shared vision for consistency in student learning. Um, are students making the appropriate gains and um, are those visions, are those um, views consistent as we move from classroom to classroom um, around Woodward? <clears throat> and finally, the staff training. Um, we're looking to collaborate with our special education department to provide um, our support staff with appropriate training in the areas of um, uh, curriculum, but also intervention strategies, data collection, and best teaching practices. Um, along the lines of the um, scheduling and staffing, I'm working, uh, we have developed a block um, on Friday afternoons that is um, relatively open. Um, when it's not used for care assemblies, it's a time that I'll be providing staff training um, in a various topics to our support staff. And finally, our third goal, um, goal three, the Woodward School will provide high quality instruction and engaging learning opportunities in the area of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math that are aligned to the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. Um, so this ties back uh, to our school vision uh, or mission statement of lifelong learning. Um, we'll be continuing with our Carolina Science rollout. It's year three. Along with that comes professional development um, for teachers. At this point, we've um, designed uh, or developed teacher goals or team goals that center around um, science instruction that look at the implementation of the science program, lessons and assessments, um, as well as using science journals to um, strengthen informative writing. Um, we would love to um, continue to employ the engineering design process um, and exploring different ways to do that outside of science. Um, you know, the, the idea of inquiry-based learning and um, using a process such as the engineering design process to identify a problem, um, discuss possible solutions, ref design um, you know, elements or, or a, um, a way to solve that first problem, <clears throat> apply it, then go back, revisit, and make corrections as needed. Um, that's a very important um, uh, process that we're going to be continuing to uh, investigate different ways to be doing that in our school. Um, one example of that, we had a one school, one read 
um, that was Marty McGuire. And in that story, um, the main character, um, Marty, is cast in the play The Frog Prince. Um, so as part of our One School, One Read, we would have um, weekly activities. The whole building was doing this at the same time in buddy groups where students were um, comparing and contrasting um, the two different versions of the fairy tale. One week we had students um, looking at fiction, uh, nonfiction text on frogs. And then the final week, we had a STEM activity where students were to, to design an apparatus that would help retrieve the golden ball from the well. Um, students worked in collaborative groups. They problem solved. They designed the plan. They talked about the materials. They created the apparatus. <clears throat> they tested it. And then they reflected back after, um, based on what they had, um, what they had noticed or, or what their experience was. Um, so we feel like there's different opportunities around our building to be utilizing this process of critically thinking about a problem. Um, we're continuing to look at the coding and, and technology integration. Um, at this point, we have plans to use coding, uh, the root coding robots in classrooms where we are integrating with um, math and sciences as well as social studies. Um, we have plans in place in those lessons um, already established where our tech specialists will be in looking at um, cardinal directions, functions of a map, and having the root coding robot navigate on a map. Um, we're also using um, root coding robots in our mathematics with um, area and perimeter and, and trying to integrate um, the technology and the coding into some of the math curriculum. Um, we're also looking to create um, community partnerships. Um, at this point, we've had several authors and storytellers come to our school, but I'd love to expand that to engineers, scientists. Um, we have so many people locally and so many companies that we, should, we can tap into. And I'm working with some SOS parents who have connections in those organizations to bring um, those guest speakers into our school. So not just authors and, and poets, but rather those people in the sciences. Um, and finally, a, a really exciting piece of this, of this goal is um, utilizing outdoor learning in the natural space. Um, we had two grants um, funded not too long ago, the first, being, uh, the first being the outdoor classroom, the second being the story walk, which you've heard about, um, and finding different ways to have students um, learning outdoors, you know, learning outside. Um, can we look at seasonal changes that tie into science curriculum and use our story walk to, um, to, lead, book, to lead students on, on this journey, ending in the outdoor classroom where there can be inquiry-based questions? So we're trying to tie it all together um, with, with that, last, um, that last component of our goal. I feel like I've talked a mile a minute. Um, <laughs> so I want to um, clearly articulate uh, um, different parts of the school improvement plan that may not have been clear um, as I went through. So please um, ask, ask any questions you may have. That was very clear. Thank you. Can you can you talk a little? It sounds like there's gonna be a lot of professional development going on. Can you talk a little bit about like how that'll be integrated? Like, are they're gonna be? I know parents get concerned about more days off, or is it gonna be during the school day, or how how's that? Um, there's a few different ways that that can happen. Um, the first is the flexible professional development time that's going to take place on teacher time outside of the the school day. Um, I've already had conversations with staff around um, developing their, um, some of them have, cho um, have developed their team goals or individual student learning goals with um, the keeping in mind the school improvement plan goals as a larger picture. And they would be um, um, using that additional time outside to um, work on some of these components. Um, I have a few staff members who are in a leadership program at this point, and um, they have been working diligently to um, redesign our science space, our lab space, and um, in that space, we'll have uh, monthly questions posed um, for students to go up and employ the um, designing uh, engineer design process. Um, so, so that wouldn't really fall under the school day, but rather that's additional time that they're willing to put in. Um, we also have um, building-based professional development, and um, Superintendent Johnson and Super Assistant Superintendent Martineau have been gracious enough to support that additional learning time um, and allowing for substitutes as needed um, we're trying to work strategically with some of our support staff so that they're able to um, work with students and not necessarily a, um, um, during a math time or an ELA time, but rather can, they, um, can that extra time happen during um, enrichment blocks, which we have weekly. 
um, or leading up into a staff meeting, um, granting teachers a, an hour prior to a staff meeting, which then would give them a few hours to work on one of those um, school improvement plan goals. Um, the Science PD is worked into our, um, our district-wide professional development, and that's going to be happening in the next few weeks. I see all of those things that you're talking about. She comes home and is really enthusiastic, and I think they're you know, really doing some great work and adding the stuff outside of the classroom to the material. And I think it's great. Thanks. Can you talk a little more about the coding robots? I sure. love how you're integrating them into, what do you say, math and uh, else? Math, social studies, and, and also sciences. You know, we want to figure out how um, robots and coding can solve real world problems. I mean, we see that every day with. Um, whether it be like a Roomba, you know, who, a robot that travels. I think of like a root coding robot as kind of like that, where you would um, develop a, um, an algorithm and then it would follow that. Um, I, I don't know that I have an absolute answer for you because I feel like this is going to be something that we continue to learn as we go. Um, they do have drawing capabilities and um, there are additional pieces that you can purchase for the coding robots that allow them to do different things. Um, <clears throat> last year, um, Amy Benford, our technology integration specialist, um, because of her work with the, the Weiss Institute, had piloted the program initially. Um, she was working with um, some of the curriculum developers um, who created Root and came up with um, student performance tasks and um, different strategy or different tasks that would have the students apply the different um, functions of the robot. In one example, it was a maze that the robot had to work through. Um, in another example, uh, certain drawings had to be made by the robot through student programming. I think there's a whole lot more we can do, and <clears throat> it's exciting to, to learn as we go. Yeah. I know my daughter really enjoyed it last year. Good. And I said before, I, Woodward was kind of a bridge for the work that um, was happening at, at Finn um, with Clay and, and the work that happens at, um, at Mary with, with Kathleen. Um, so we were kind of lacking the last two years. We, we piloted it, but we're waiting for those actual robots to arrive, which they did last year. But we were kind of in a holding pattern. Um, so we did a lot of the legwork with um, stitch coding, um, which was a precursor to the actual function of the robots. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thank you. That's a very Thanks. good presentation. And I like to think you've got some very well-defined goals and a lot of bullets underneath. So. Thanks. 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 Right. And that brings us to the uh, MASC MASS joint conference discussion and a review of the resolutions. Um, Annual event. Is anyone going? I guess is the first question. Mm -hmm. You're not registered yet. I don't think so. Oh. You think you're going? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Because normally what we do is one of whoever's going gets somebody gets appointed to be a delegate to the convention that they have there and where they discuss all these <laughs> resolutions. Which I'm told, I've never been to that, but I'm told they typically change a lot. They change on the floor. Yeah. <coughs> that would be important up to the participants uh, with the voting delegates. So what you see in the document may not be what is eventually voted on by the delegates. So it's a pretty interactive process. Do we know what day it's on for the conference? It's on fr the um, voting. The it's on Friday. on Friday. At two. Okay. I think so. We were all trying to decide if, because we all can't go the whole time, so we were trying to decide who would go beginning, who go, you know, at what points, and then I don't think we came up with anything yet, but we'll figure it out. Okay. We should vote to appoint somebody as the delegate. <laughs> so. I think I'll be there Friday, so I could do that. Okay. So vote taken. <laughs> we have to submit this to the to the MESC board. So we don't need a okay. formal vote. Just, no. Okay. Okay. You're in. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, the re resolution the resolutions are in the packet. I don't know if anyone has any. Comments on these? Yeah, seems to make sense to me. Yeah. 
we actually um, attended a Mars session, and the commissioner, Commissioner Riley, and a newly appointed um, finance director, Paul Whitmore, uh, was at the presentation. And they touched upon a couple of the items that are in the resolution from a not only financial standpoint, but also um, practicality standpoint in terms of how we do business. And the resolution number five is very much um, like the charter school discussion that we had some years ago about making sure that any other school publicly funded um, is held to the same accountability standards, which wasn't necessarily the case when the charter schools start, started mm -hmm. to form. So there is some similarity in language from the, that resolution uh, to this one. Also, the um, small and rural district um, resolution is incredibly um, focused on just about anything west of Worcester. Um, an appreciation for uh, what is really taking place in Western Mass with respect to the funding and the challenges that um, the rural districts are, are facing, whether it's a regional district or whether it's a single town. And they have been working to gain um, sort of credibility in terms of their concerns now for almost five to 10 years. And I know that's a long period of time. And have a very powerful coalition, uh, particularly from a regional standpoint. Um, they are also faced with charter schools moving into their area and very, very much declining Chapter 70 funding because of the enrollments. So even with five students or six students in their classes, which some of them have, they still have to have a 1.0 teacher in that class. So again, declining Chapter 70 funding um, to the point where they were finally heard and received um, a $1.5 million sort of, um, infusion of, of money from the governor this year. But as you can imagine, with all the towns west of us, that's, that didn't go very far. But um, a couple of the things that were part of the discussion, which the rural school districts are moving forward with, um, very much were part of our conversations um, with Carolyn Dyson most recently around what innovative practices or what kinds of things could change from the DESE um, standpoint that would allow us to be more flexible in our work regardless of where we were located. The rural schools are really moving forward with um, requesting that the governor and or DESE look at sort of the constraints placed upon all districts it's 990 or 900 and 180. From a rural district standpoint, if they were looking at a four-day school week instead of five, they could really um, have some efficiencies and savings in terms of costs that they're realizing, whether it's you know heating and, and utilities or whether it's bus transportation. So they're really having the same conversations for different reasons than that we're having here and aligning with some of their work on this particular issue might provide us with the support because they are getting the attention at the state level um, as well as giving them some support for in a small way for some of the things they're requesting like give us an opportunity to help ourselves by eliminating that waiver requirement so um, that might be something that we want to talk with Carolyn Dykema about a little bit more and get some support behind this resolution um, just so they can do and provide for their children the same type of equitable experience that we have in the more, you know, um, socioeconomic rich areas that we, that are east of Metro West. So um, that might be something that is um, sort of a two for we can support their work and also support our goals of trying to get some relief from the requirements of 990 or 900 in 180 days. Um, so that was an interesting one. And with the discussions that we've had about the Health and Wellness Committee, um, several uh, further on the agenda, but again, there's something about health education, and I know we keep talking about the curriculum and health education, so that might be something of interest as well. Just pointing out a couple of the resolutions that might have some um, impact on the work that we're doing within our district. <coughs> Move ahead then to the legislative update. Do you have anything to talk about? Because I have a couple things from today. Take it away. So just recently, um, our special ed director attended a session about changes in Medicaid. 
um, and how those um, reimbursements are calculated. We've had many, many conversations uh, about how circuit breaker is funded and what kinds of um, situations are allowed to be submitted for reimbursement. So the Medicaid conversation, while it doesn't help us directly because the funding doesn't come directly to the schools, we process the payments. We incur a cost to have these payments processed. Um, and then any reimbursements go directly to the town. So directly, they do not come to our district, but indirectly, we all benefit from that, right? At the regional level, it comes directly to the school system because it's a, a town. So they're looking at now things um, like vision and hearing, which were not included in the process before, so that could bring about some reimbursements somewhere along the way, uh, whether it's the town or, or the region. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I, I really hate to bring up this one word, but it's relevant for the conversation and it's buses. Um, so almost every uh, regional district that was there today, as well as conversations I've had with neighboring superintendents, the conversation is pretty much the same, whether it was Groton Dunstable or Marlboro and Hudson uh, at the Acevet Collaborative. Uh, the challenges that we are all having uh, very similar to us and in some cases stories that are significantly more um, dramatic than, than ours, although our conversations were difficult as well. And what is going on in terms of the bidding process, that in fact when we do go out for bid for bus transportation, A, it's very difficult to find vendors who have the number of buses that we need, but also oftentimes there is only one bidder. And so what can the state do to provide some relief and true competition in this bidding process for towns where it appears as if there is a single um, you know, transportation provider who is particularly bidding into an area. So that conversation is going on at the state level because it's all a challenge that all the districts face. And um, so I thought that was a, an interesting and very timely and relevant conversation that, that all of the districts are facing. And we, as a matter of fact, in Hudson, um, Marlboro, and our two districts, um, I've engaged some conversations with the superintendent about some collaborative sharing around transportation coordinators and providers. Um, not all of us need a full-time coordinator, but all of us need a coordinator. So what could we do in a collaborative environment and share that um, cost? But also, what kinds of message can we do? We all have the same uh, transportation provider. We all have NRT. So what can we do as the bidding process gets closer? Because a lot of us are going out next year for the RFP. It is the fifth year of the contract for most of us in the area. So it's good that the conversation is continuing and you know where it goes and what it yields. It's too soon to tell, but we're having it. And they're having it at the state level as well. Can I ask where they are the only bidder for us? Yes. And that is the norm. So in a geographic area, and you can almost pick the, the transportation provider. You know, there are only probably a handful in this, you know, east, um, in our geographic area, and there tends to be one bidder, and only one. So that's a recognized reality that we face, and so what can we do about it, and how can we start having those conversations? So that, that was one of the resolutions here was number four was about regional school transportation, mm -hmm. but you know, it seemed to be addressing that issue. Right. I don't know what this law is that they're proposing getting rid of. But so <coughs> that was a big discussion this afternoon, or uh, this morning. That really refers to language that suggests if we decide as a school district or a regional district, whether it's a region or a single district, to provide our own bus transportation um, because we've purchased buses, we can't get into the bus business. In other words, we can't go to Westboro and say, hey, how'd you like to rent our buses? So that's really what that speaks okay. to. You can have any fleet you want and produce that fleet and support that fleet through your budget, but we're in the business of education, not bus transportation, and that's really what this speaks to. And we spent a lot of time talking about that today um, and trying to clarify what that actually meant. So there's, and there's a $45 million supplemental budget that's been floating around at the state level, uh, mostly for safety and um, uh, mental health services, and they can't tell us where it's going. 
this summer the governor released a whole bunch of language about all this money that's going to become available and that 45 million dollars is fizzling fast but it's hopeful that some of that money will still remain intact by the time the discussions are happening and believe it um, we're in october of fy19 it's an fy18 supplemental budget that they're discussing so fy18 never dies and hopefully if it doesn't some money will come our way And that brings us to old business and the K-12 world language update. Very exciting work by our K-12 language uh, study group. And um, Kathleen has um, in your packet, there's a, a copies of the presentation. And I think Kathleen's going to, as she has throughout this process, um, yes. share the great work. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Just trying to connect. We will get there. It's me and technology. <laughs> Every time. Okay, Every I want to see if I can connect. It's really key. Mm -hmm. Well, it's in the packet okay. too, Kathleen. It is. Uh, Plan B. <clears throat> All right, Plan B. You have it? Let's see. Here it is. All right, Keith, you want to operate it? I'll go through. I'll Thank you. Uh, so I'm happy tonight to present the work that we have done together as a K-12 world language study. I want to um, begin by uh, reviewing our purpose for this study group. Our task was to examine the research, explore programs, trends, and approaches in other districts K-12, through assess the current programs in our district K-12, through present our findings to Superintendent Johnson, and then share our findings with the South Coast School Committee. So thank you for allowing me to do so. I want to thank our committee members, which were, which consisted of 10, uh, 10 member committee with representation from the school committee and principals and administrators K-12 across the three districts. Teachers, teachers <coughs> Um, so some of our work included looking into the benefits of early exposure to language study and cultural benefits and a lot of our research um, focused on academics um, as well as cognitive development. Uh, it also uh, helped to increase standardized testing scores, cultural awareness and competency, career opportunities, understanding and security and community and society. Early language also, um, exposure also results in accelerated acquisition of language. And bilingual experience has shown to improve cognitive abilities, especially in problem solving. So current world language programs within our district, at Melikan and Trottier in the, at the sixth grade level, it is a, an exploratory program, so it meets twice weekly and students receive an equal experience of French and Spanish a half year each. And then in seventh grade, students have that opportunity to continue in that world, in that one of those, either the, Span the Spanish or the French. And this grade level course is a full year course with um, students progression in their proficiency to read, write, listen and speak in that selected language. And then in eighth grade, they continue that same language that they took in grade seven, which prepares them for the advanced study at the high school level. 
Um, students gain a solid foundation and practice of proficiency in language acquisition. And then as they transition to Algonquin, um, they are offered opportunities, uh, ninth grade students, an opportunity to enroll in advanced level courses, which includes, again, Spanish and French, but also the opportunity to enroll in Latin. And all of these languages are offered at levels that support the student's level of readiness, including college, honors, and advanced placement. So this is, uh, this, So this highlights, this, this slide highlights the connections of to other academic content areas as well as social and linguistic benefits. Thank you. And I think it's important to keep in mind that middle school world language experiences prepare our students as they move on to high school um, for those opportunities and that they are afforded as a high school um, student. And it's also important to remember that this is a progression of learning beginning in sixth grade all the way through 12th grade. So a typical K-5 language, uh, there are three language acquisition models. The first one is referred to as the FLEX. It's for foreign language exploratory. And that's between one to 5% instructional time. This is the easiest program to implement because it doesn't impact the master schedule. Typically, it's between, it's either before or an after school opportunity. And it's things like this, other schools that we've talked to bring in uh, either teachers provide it at the, at the, uh, as an uh, extension at the end of the day, or they have volunteers, there may be parents who are bilingual, and so those opportunities don't impact the learning throughout the day, yet they bring this opportunity to the students. So that's the FLEX program. The second um, model is FLESS, which is foreign language in elementary schools, and that's between five and 50%. And this does lead towards proficiency, but it also, it also impacts the, the school schedule it typically meets multiple times um, during the week. It requires staff, it requires space, and it requires time in the schedule, as well as funding. And this is more difficult to implement than the flex because it does require it to happen within the school day. The last model is immersion, which is between 50 and 100%. So it's either a full or a partial model and this is the most effective program um, for gaining proficiency. Uh, but it's also the most difficult to implement because it requires, again, uh, staff, space, schedule, as well as funding. So those are the three uh, models that we explored. So a K-5 snapshot of programs offered um, by the three different models locally including schools within our, um, not network, hmm? region. region, thank you, and, and local towns as well. So there, as you can see, there are some school uh, districts that don't have any identified programs, leading all the way through the three different models uh, up to immersion. And within our district, this is our progression of learning. As you can see in grade six, it's those uh, that ex year of exploratory learning, half year French, half year Spanish. And then in seven and eighth grade, students uh, identify the language that they are going to um, spend the next two years learning, whether it be <coughs> French or Spanish. And then in ninth, ninth and 10th, that's when they continue with their Spanish or their French or have an option to take Latin. And depending on where their level of proficiency is, entering in from eighth grade into ninth grade will determine which course that they take within that language. And then 11th and 12th, uh, the opportunities continue. And again, depending on the level of proficiency. 
that will determine which course level that they take. So the factors of influence, uh, so after we had done all of our research as a team, we met and we decided, well, what does this look like for us and what are our next steps? And what do we need to consider when making those steps, taking those steps? So the first factor of influence is the adoption of the instructional model. What model would best meet all our needs? And we determined that we needed to continue to examine current K-5 through models of language acquisition learning and identifying staffing needs. This might include going to visit other districts looking at their models, considering how we could implement it in, in our schools. Alignment of learning, continue to examine the implications for change. Based on the adoption at the K-5 level, what does that look like for middle school and secondary levels? And we thought those, that was important to consider. Curriculum frameworks, we need to continue to examine the, the interdisciplinary teaching and learning and connections within the newly released K-5 social studies and ELA frameworks. And scheduling, how's that going to impact our master schedules? Do we go with a model that expands extracurricular activities K-5? through And I think the point that we're at, and I'll speak to Neri, we are looking for those opportunities at our Friday Farewell, which is a weekly Friday meeting that we have. We've now shifted our focus to what we call multicultural moments. So we're bringing experiences to our students through various, exposing them to various cultures and languages. And then um, funding, identify options to support the models that, the model that we, we identify as the one that would work best for us, including grants, community connections, revolving and operational funds, and collaborative cost sharing. So again, uh, thank you to our World Language Study Group and uh, any questions and answers that I can provide to you. Yeah, I have a few. <coughs> um, <coughs> the, the, one, the different models where you have the percentages yes. of instructional time, is that the percentage that you're speaking, the language, what the language you're trying to work, or what is, the, what is that percentage? It's a combination, it would be the instruction, instruction typical to a the instruction that happens at a middle school, it's it's speaking and speaking and listening, it's writing, it's reading, it's conversational. Depending, well, the one to five percent would be more, um, I would think, exposure to to conversational. Okay. And in the, the cost part, <coughs> oh, too far. I mean. From what I understand, it's, it's difficult to find language teachers. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So even if we had the money, <laughs> I mean, how I don't feasible think is it? I mean, how much of a gating factor is that? I guess is the question. Well, I think a lot of districts do have these opportunities, so don't I don't think it's insurmountable, but I think it would be difficult. Okay. Do you have sort of a gut? feeling for which model might be best for us at this point? Now, as a, as a committee, we thought our next step would be to go visit some and actually see what it looks like in the, in the schools and have conversations with the teachers and the administration. And uh, I think Roto Web would play a key role in this yeah. as well. We'd be able to go explore those. And I think that's one of the key next steps. What do the middle school language teachers think? Like, is there gut feeling to that we should be having more instruction? But you know, what, what do they think about? They're that? always going to say yes. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, they're very passionate about their content areas and love it when students come to them with a uh, bilingual experience of any type. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that always adds, that enriches the instruction and the experience for the other children in the classroom. So. Yes, I would say that they would absolutely support it and then have to make adjustments mm -hmm. accordingly. And I think that was a key point of what Kathleen said at the end, is whatever we decide to do would have an impact on our courses, on our program of study, and what we would be able to offer. I think the conversations we've had around, uh, specifically around sixth grade, 
yeah. language um, right now to split year exploratory. Yeah. And um, I think there's been conversation around making that a more um, robust experience mm -hmm. around a specific language. And maybe think about what that exploratory could look like in fifth grade. And that was it start that conversation started even prior to the committee beginning. That was something that yeah. was on their agenda. Yeah, I mean, I know my daughter's and my older daughter's in seventh grade, and she, so she did the split last year, and she chose French, and she had a hard time picking mm. because she loved both, mm -hmm. and I was surprised how much she liked foreign language. Like, mm. I, I mean, she, the French is, I think, her second favorite class when she lists all her favorites. Like, she mm -hmm. adores French. She mm -hmm. loves learning it. She loves the teacher. So I, I mean, I'm all for creating that experience earlier if we can. But seeing, you know, how she's taken to it and hearing, you know, her friends love the class. Like they all look forward to it. So, you know, I had language starting in first grade, and I Did found it mm -hmm. beneficial. So. Is, is this the plan in, in terms of like when you started? Is it K one? What what at uh, what point is considered? Or are you talking about in terms of implementing one of these programs? Again, I think we need to go and explore what those look like. Some schools have it K through mm -hmm. five, starting in K. Some have it full immersion in K. Others begin it in third grades. Others beginning it in fifth grade. Fifth, yeah. So if you did say full immersion, do you know what other towns are doing? This might be a phase two question, but you know, like just one class of it and. From what I know, there, Framingham, for example, has full immersion, and I believe Lexington has full immersion. Once you are in that program, or selected to be in, or choose to be in that program, you're in it for the rest of the, the K through five experience. I don't know what that looks like. I'd love to go and experience right. that and have those conversations because I think that's really important to have, to be able to make that decision that works best for our, our <coughs> K through five. I mean, they're not all like, like say there's five kindergarten classes. It might be one that's full immersion. Yes. Okay. Right. I can speak to Holliston, full immersion, Holliston French. Uh, two classes typically in K, uh, full immersion. Then they stay with that cohort all the way up to grade five. Um, then it broadens out in grade three where you have half the day English, half the day French, and then you slowly um, take in more English instruction and then less of the French. Is it the same teacher for five years? Um, no, so they don't do a different teacher. And it is a tremendous struggle to maintain uh, language teachers in the area. I think that's a, a conversation too that lends itself well to sort of the collaborative dialogue between districts. So. You know, what are our neighboring districts? Not a lot of our neighboring districts in the Assabet Valley Collaborative are at this point. Mm -hmm. They do not have immersion programs. They don't have FLESS programs. So kind of like the bus transportation conversation, although you know, far more um, educationally sound, I guess, um, is a conversation about how we can share instructors. So I know at the high school level, because it is a bookend conversation, right? It's what's going on at the high school level. And they can have um, a very different adoption schedule of a new program, as they're talking about doing, um, you know, adding another <coughs> language. We have French, Spanish, and um, really, as a, as a high school, um, a high-performing high school, having only two languages is um, not as common as you would think. A lot of them have branched out into a third language, and that's part of the conversations that have been ongoing at the high school. That can happen. Uh, with planful work at just the high school level. When we start at the K-5, we're talking about really building a strategic uh, plan over the grades to make sure that whatever we do at the K-5, when it becomes a proficiency level, how does that impact middle and then how does that impact high school? Because it would uh, become very systemic. But to share an instructor, because not all teachers are full-time teachers at the K-5 level, particularly if there's only one or two sections of, a, of an immersion class. So, you know, engaging in that conversation in a collaborative way with our neighboring districts uh, who now do not have a program. Mm -hmm. um, I commend the work of the committee. It's really the first time we've had a conversation about what are we doing around you know, language acquisition, uh, world language acquisition at the K-5 level. So it's a great place to start. 
and from there we can go in a lot of directions. I think um, not to use steam in a different way, but uh, as this picks up some steam, I think those kinds of conversations could broaden and expand to our collaborative districts uh, because we could then share resources. So scheduling is a, is a factor and so is you know staff but those are sort of the tangible pieces of the reality of, of implementation, but shouldn't sort of hold us back in the direction that we want to move. So what do we do now? I think the next step is to continue the conversation and to really explore what some of these programmatic uh, models are like, um, and really maybe to engage some conversations with our, our collaborative schools. There are 13, very few of them are represented and to see if we can work together um, in partnership to develop a model uh, for implementation. <coughs> I would love to see, or someone would love to see, uh, at some point next year, a, a sort of a report on what the programs look like, and maybe move forward with uh, an adoption of one or more of them, and um, have that become part of the funding cycle for next year. What about, um surveying parents on what, mm -hmm. what they mm -hmm. want. And the part of the second tier work, sure, of the community. Which could be done, you know, the work doesn't end. We can continue the, the work mm -hmm. and build towards uh, visitations either this year or next year with some sort of presentation in the fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, are you okay with <laughs> keeping this group going? I'm all in. Mm -hmm. right. So it sounds like you're hoping to have recommendations on where we want to move next year. Next year, yeah. like in the fall next year, so we can budget for it. Yeah, I think that's a realistic expectation. Okay. Good. Yeah. I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to, you know, you know how like I said before about how we want a wish list of items. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we should. I think did we already have this on there? Because I know we've talked to advisory we did. previously. We did. Yeah, we had it on a wish list a little bit ago. But I think that's the kind of thing we should raise with them, and so they're aware of it. There are parts of the first step, the um, FLEC, FLEC, FLE, first mm -hmm. step, that are already going on, as Kathleen said, in the mm -hmm. nearest school. And all of that generation, it generates an excitement with the parent community mm -hmm. around, you know, the students having opportunities to explore world cultures or to, mm -hmm. to learn, you know, some language, to mm -hmm. have some language acquisition. So that's kind of exciting. And we have that here and there in a couple places in the district. So to start with that energy and that knowledge and that understanding probably will yield some great responses from parents too when the survey goes up. Yep. All right. Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank thanks you. for all the work that went into this. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> and brings us to the kindergarten update on transition to tuition free. So I actually have uh, what I think is uh, a watershed moment. Uh, I know that we have not started our review of the uh, preliminary numbers for FY20, um, but have been mindful of uh, you know a number of emails and some conversations that have come my way with respect to <coughs> the tuition. I'd, I'd like to go back and, and give a little history to this conversation because I think it's important to put uh, where we're going in perspective in terms of where we've been. So I pulled, uh, I did some research in my inbox and found that the first meeting on this topic was held uh, November 11th, 2014. And I um, want to recognize Sarah Carr and Debbie Nazaro and Emily Collins who joined myself and Jim Randall, Randall in an exploratory conversation about tuition free kindergarten. And from there, it evolved lots and lots of meetings, folders all about kindergarten, and um, culminated in some sort of a presentation in October of 2015 where uh, we presented a transitioning to full uh, free day K model. And the projection at that time was we would hope to be tuition free in 2021-22. Um, the numbers that we were looking at in terms of revenue projections, the fact that there was a kindergarten grant at the time, as well as um, enrollment figures uh, somewhat different than what they are now, started at 3250 and each successive year reduced the tuition 
uh, from 30 to 50 to 3,000 to 23 to 1750 to 15 to zero. Our progression has gone from 30 to 50 to 2,000 to this conversation tonight. Um, at that time, we were not uh, inclined to uh, support the transitioning model. Uh, had some more conversations, great participation from members of the school committee and the study group. I went back to the drawing board, came back with a revised transition uh, plan and um, became a budget priority for, the, for our work. And I think this is so key because it does speak to how important those budget priorities are in guiding our work. Uh, many, many meetings. Uh, the projections that we had in FY16 to FY20 in this particular PowerPoint, we had different renditions. This was in February of 2015. Had us, believe it or not, 101 in FY19. And we have 103 full paying, uh, full tuition students. So that, I don't know if that was a dark board that we hit by luck or was strategic analysis of both NESDEC enrollments and census. Um, we have a combination of two revenue sources, not three any longer, the grant long since sunsetted. And so um, what we look to do is have that strategic balance of enough revenue to um, slowly shift costs to the operational budget while either ceasing to collect tuitions and expending down that money or to continue to uh, move the process out multiple years by collecting tuition. So after some analysis, and I um, projected out to FY 2020, 2022 in the budget analysis, if we move $80,000 onto operational this year, which initial review of some of the numbers is a possibility. And the revenue stream that we project for this year um, trends to the positive. We would be able to, with the commitment by the school committee to, to also expend down all of the reserve revolving funds next year, uh, half of that in 21 as we move to budget for 21 and move 50,000 on to operational. And in FY22, spend down the, all of the revolving funds um, and move another 50,000 on, which is doable. We could go free tuition next year. So could you repeat that? So. Review, so the, review the numbers of those revolving funds. Yeah. And yeah. So, so right now we have a base, right? We, we started the year with some revolving funds, and I intend to break this out more in the budget when we get to the budget process, but I know the conversation tonight and what is the feasibility of this. Yeah. So what we would do um, as, is as we have done since we moved in this direction. So the first year, we transitioned some funding from what used to be dependent on tuition to operational. I think it was 100,000 the first year we moved. And we're able to do this not because there's this great pool of money waiting to be absorbed by free full day K, but purposely making decisions as an administrative team that uh, we choose to fund this initiative as opposed to fund something else. Uh, that's why it's a priority. And it continues. So when we started this conversation, we were about 50-50 um, operational and um, dependent on tuition. Right now we're about 72 to 74% um, on operational, which is a huge shift in two years. And with this move, um, we would be able to support a, tu a tuition-free model next year with the commitment by the school committee that in subsequent years, they're also going to move 50,000 more into the operational budget it's for a total of about 200,000 more that has to be absorbed in the operational budget. Right now, our dependency on revenue for the revolving funds is about $165,000. So when we stop collecting tuition, we still have some money in the revolving account, which has to be spent on kindergarten. So, so that's four years at 50000 a year, basically? Two at 50, one at 80. Okay. FY20 at 80. Okay. And the two subsequent years would be 50. The two subsequent years would be um, expending 
half in each of those years of the remaining tuition collected in revolving funds. So it's doable. I feel very confident that um, if there's support for this, we could be tuition free next year. The, I will say that I'm excited about that because in all of the presentations, our target was three to five years. Now, if we did not want to commit to that, we could reduce our tuition next year. Um, we could reduce it to 1500 collect some more tuition revolving, and not shift as much in those subsequent years. But eventually, there has to become, there's a balance, right? Tuition has to zero out. So I think this is the, easy, this is the fastest way to get there. And the soonest we can commit to a model that would allow us to say with fairly um, good resolve that we could be tuition free next year. Because it would spend down the tuition revolving over a period of three years. So this year, for example, in the model, um, we, will be, we will be using about $165,000 here it is, $165, of tuition revolving. This is 2019. Mm -hmm. And then it goes down from there. So obviously I can go through the numbers, and I will when we have the budget <coughs> presentation, but I wanted to, for tonight, uh, just be prepared to say what is possible with the commitment of the budget shifting from, from dependency on revolving to operational. So this year, as I say this year, I'm already in FY20. If we shift that 80, marry that with about uh, $133,000 of revolving, that leaves us with the balance that would be split between the two subsequent years, matched with another 50,000 on operational. And we could sustain that. Now also, one of the things that I'm most concerned about is, you know, it's, it's okay to say we can sustain that, but we also have to appreciate what happens if enrollments go up a little. So this year with seven teachers, um, and I would encourage us to remain at that number going forward um, throughout this transition process, we could absorb, because of our current class sizes, we could absorb about 20 students. So we could see growth still allow sustainability without adding additional teachers. That would bring your class sizes up to about 18, which is still very reasonable and we're not within our class size policy. We have seven sections, probably add three per section. So that gives us some growth factor in there as well because we don't want to talk about we can go to tuition free and then say, oh, we have to add a teacher right now because that's another, you know, whatever amount on the budget. So um, that's where we are. I'm, extremely pleased to be able to report that. I think, you know, kudos and, and uh, com commendations to everybody who's been involved in this conversation. It was an all-in commitment by the building administration to support this move. Um, I, think, I think it's a moment of pride for everyone to have South Grove become one of the many or the more districts that are, that are now offering free full, um, I know Paul I keep saying tuition free. <laughs> tuition, it's not free for kindergarten, <laughs> but tuition free um, kindergarten. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's, you know, kind of hard to sort of sign off on this without seeing the whole budget picture, but you know, I trust mm -hmm. that you know your numbers, so it's very encouraging. Yeah, uh, you know, um, they're here, and, you know, I can go over the detail with, with some, some omission of names, but. Um, reviewed numerous times with several people just to make sure the numbers are accurate. And again, I, I, I suggest to you tonight that what we would want to do is make sure that the revenue projections that we have for this year are tracking to the positive. Um, and once that money is in, our, uh, what I also did was move 21 and 22 forward in terms of what I think contractual raises would be. So making sure that we're not using FY18 or 19 dollars to inform our decisions for FY22, and they're not. They're, you know, their cost escalations have been including, included in the numbers. We don't have to make a decision tonight. Um, 
I, I'm also, I know we're not jumping to 20, but this is about FY20's budget. We have um, had a great uh, working session this week, and because um, we've been able to eliminate a lot of the, the heavy paper involved in the budgeting process, I know, I, I feel fairly confident in, in suggesting to you that we might be able to look at the preliminary budget the first week in December. I think our numbers will be in. We're looking at all of our grants because a lot of our staff is, is compensated on grants. We have to not just worry about what's on operation, but where is everybody being, you know, where are they being paid from? All of our financial resources. What are our revolving accounts like in terms of facility rental, which Brian's going to get into a little bit more. That's just all factors in in terms of making some decisions. But um, we had a, a great working session. I know the principals have been at um, their budgeting um, work at the building levels. We have a deadline for Tuesday to review our South Bro numbers, uh, at least preliminarily, and that gives us another you know, good month to chew on those numbers before we prevent, present them to school committee. If we're able to go forward with the preliminary, um, you know, all to uh, all, more times than not, we have voted the very same preliminary as our recommended. We have that appropriate wait time by one month, but um, we could certainly, depending on you know what our position was about the budget, uh, bring that in um, for a preliminary and a recommended, or we could have another school committee meeting for the budget if we if we really needed to. I did meet with Mark Purple this week, and uh, we talked about what are the real deadlines because there was some a little bit of confusion, and I think um, we could live with with um, approving the budget in December. If the numbers come in and we are moving all along at a fairly rapid pace, I might even be able to, um, I don't want to commit to this tonight, but I might even be able to bring preliminary numbers in November. So again, a lot of great work by a lot of folks sitting around the table and having some good conversations about where we're headed. Great. We've done. We've moved all of our staffing forward already, so we have our staffing moves forward. And now we just have to sit down and look at it holistically in terms of what does that mean for South Pro K eight, and how does that fit into our budget priorities? Very good. Anything else on that? Uh, I'm I'm up for a Yahoo on this. <laughs> I'm really excited. Yeah, that is it's Thank very you. exciting. <laughs> I hear a lot from parents asking about this, so they'll appreciate this update. We're two years earlier than we thought. Yeah, that's amazing. He does own the numbers out there, so uh, I'll, yeah, you, you, I'll give the, the sheets. Okay. Absolutely. I'll send them to anybody who'd like to review them. All right. Uh, moving on then, we have the Health and Wellness Committee update. So the update is um, couple things uh, we have posted for the position interestingly enough um, the health grant that we receive that funds a lot of the work um, from the district nurse leader and um, pays for some of the supplies and some of the tests and so forth that we use is actually changing significantly next year so the part of the grant that required us to have a health district health leader uh, may not even be included in the grant any longer. So um, in many conversations with Lori Pardee before she retired and is happily traversing the continents um, at this point in time, um, <coughs> she's been very um, committed to the notion that it's in such flux we're not really sure what we're going to see in terms of the grant, which again creates difficulty in budgeting, right? So her feeling in conversations with um, the state is that they're going to fund specific silos of focus rather than a holistic approach uh, through the grant, which will potentially present some challenges to us as a district in terms of how we want to fund this position. Um, I bring that up because Lori actually drove a lot of the work of the Health and Wellness Committee. So we've posted for her for the remainder of this year, her position internally. Um, and we do have a number of applicants. And that person temporarily, along with um, Kyle Parson, the food service director, will sort of steer the ship. 
but it does present some opportunities for conversations about where we want to go forward with the Health and Wellness Committee, which was required uh, by the nutrition program, not by the nursing program, not by the, um, the grant. The nurse leader position was a requirement of the grant, but the reason we have a Health and Wellness Committee is because it's required of the, the nutrition program. So it's been sort of a morphing. Um, a couple things that I would like to suggest that um, as we move forward, and I know, um, Jen, you're very much interested in this conversation, is a dialogue about what is the purpose now of the Health and Wellness Committee. It's existed in its current format for many years, but is it time now to really engage in a more broad-based conversation about where we see this committee going? And is it an important enough position to think about stipending sort of someone whose primary focus is just moving our health and wellness initiatives forward? So it's a different approach to that. And I bring that up because just, um, you know, today I quickly wrote down a number of things that would fit very nicely into that whole um, health and wellness conversation. Uh, one of them just came up two week, last week. Uh, Dr. Medina and the um, Metro West Coalition and the Southboro um, Youth and Family and uh, Marnie Houlihan uh, reached out through my office and wanted to have an in-depth conversation about how collectively we could influence the bylaws in the town of Southboro with respect to vaping and, you know, akin to the tobacco uh, regulations. The state has basically said 21 is the is the you know the point at which you can purchase these products. And do, do we want to have conversations with the town of Southboro and the various boards about what we can do around the proliferation of this? Um, so does the state have that as a regulation? Is they do. Right. So they so they have vaping. Do 21 regulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so Dr. Medina, obviously this is a passion of his, and so it ended up, we met this week, we met on Monday, and um, it was myself, um, Dr. <coughs> Medina, and Mark Purple. So uh, we all decided we would go off in different directions, but this is something that a health and wellness committee could spearhead if we change the focus of the work. And so um, he's moving on to the health board the Board of Health in Southboro for conversations. Dr. Bendina has moved on to gathering more data and checking in the regulations, and here I am moving on to some conversations about the health of the moms. Obviously, this is something that is very important to us. The implications of vaping are still not known, right, fully. So um, that's where it resides, but this is something that really doesn't reside in the superintendent's office. It really should be going to a committee whose purpose is to you know, talk about these issues on a broader level and then working together see if we want to move in this direction or not. So that is um, that's something we've been talking about. Um, we had a wonderful presentation. I was actually s quite surprised. Um, you might have seen the flyers on um, sexting, which is uh, a pretty um, more than I even expected to hear uh, pervasive, very destructive practice. And the Women's Coalition uh, Commission from Framingham sponsored this news in New Ethro. So again, health and wellness, right? Health and well-being it isn't just the physical, it's also the social and emotional piece. And then I've had some initial conversations through the chair with the school committee about moving forward with a very successful model that has been launched in several districts, uh, and that is to engage the services of a third party um, health and wellness provider uh, and have them locate in one of our schools. So that oftentimes when we make a referral, students are waiting months and months and months to get, to get an appointment. And so in many, in many districts, including the one that Dr. Medina works in, um, they've built a collaborative relationship with a third-party vendor 
we give them geography, we give them space. We incur no cost for this access, and we have preferential um, service providers for our students. So that if we're making a referral, and it doesn't supplant any position that we have now, it rather um, provides a higher level of service. So when we make a referral because a student is in need, oftentimes that student is without um, a good educational experience at that point because they need other kinds of services. So having the ability to have pr proprietary access is oftentimes incredibly helpful to parents. Um, I would say I'm a little bit familiar with it. Um, Craig Maxim, who has actually volunteered to come and present, um, sort of is the creator of this model. And he started in the school where I was high school principal years ago. Since then, um, there have been numerous districts that have adopted this model. In districts where there aren't as many providers or there aren't as many you know, available resources, um, oftentimes they just select the one that happens to be in the community. For our district, my recommendation would be that we pursue an RFP because I think we, we want, we would be an attractive venue for um, you know, Charles River Medical or UMass or South Pearl Medical uh, to come into our schools. We've had preliminary conversations um, and we believe that to start this model, it would be best to start at our preschool, um, kindergarten, where you're building, you know, um, change of behaviors service providers. For our youngest students, we do know that um, the need is, is um, high at the preschool level. So um, this is, again, a zero cost to the district and a complete upside for our parents. So this is something that you know the Health and Wellness Committee could really partner with us on. So you know how we form that is, is going to be essential. Are these mental health services or medical services or both? Mental health services. Did we talk about this in the we combined did. school? Yeah. yeah, I thought we talked. So about we this. actually yeah. had a presentation. Um, I invited them in over the summer. Dr. Medina was present. Um, Sarah Cassell was present. Um, Craig Maxim came and also uh, provided some support. And it went out, you know, as a general invitation and to the coalition who um, engage in this on a regular basis. Um, they were present. Family and Youth Services attended, and unanimous that this just makes sense you know there's very little downside um, the importance is to say to the parents we have no relationship with this provider this is to provide <coughs> ready access and services to your child you can choose to go any place you want yeah. but the relationship established allows us allows us to get quick care for our parents for our students so we I would like to move forward with an RFP um, we would not be writing it I'm not the most knowledgeable Craig Maxim who has done this for many districts um, would be happy to provide us with the language as he has in others and just put that out there and see what we can see what we can attract um, Clayton uh, has I think we've just we've, I don't know if we actually decided but we had a lot of conversations that we might be able to find uh, a space not a lot of space they don't require a lot of space um, at Finn uh, for, for those parents because we do know we have a lot of students coming in at the younger age and they need these direct services. So uh, very excited about it. It's a new venue for us. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I think it's a great idea. I would you know, encourage, encourage also, you know, in terms of mental health services, one of the things for the RFP to think about is to look at places that are providing, providers who are doing empirically supported treatment. So you'll have a lot of mental health providers who just kind of do eclectic mm -hmm. therapy, and that's not, the, you know, we want to be like, having providers come in who actually do or therapies that are supported by evidence to help kids. So I think that would be one criteria to think about in the RFP. So my thought would be to invite Craig back with Dr. Medina and just extend an open invitation. Okay. Um, like we did again to the health and you know, <coughs> health providers in our communities. And then just have those questions asked. Um, I think and I believe it's something that we can move on this year. Can I ask about I don't know if I missed something, but you were saying that we have, when you were talking about the funding for mm. a position for health and wellness, is that, can you talk a little bit about that position? Because I'm not sure I'm totally familiar with sure. that. Sure. So right now, the district nurse leader is funded through district nurse a leader. nursing grant. Right. And so my suggestion would be that we look, not that they would not be a participant on the committee, 
but that we look at what are our expectations around a health and wellness committee? What do we need? What are we looking for from when, this committee? When you say that, like our subcommittee, is that what you're talking about? Or a committee about? that's district wide. Okay. Yeah. So the members of the health and wellness committee have included members of the school committee. There's usually a representative, I think, Jen volunteered to be um, that to, to be the liaison, but it also includes parents from our community. Um, there are teachers, some of our um, health care providers in the district, so it's very broad based. Uh, but as I said, it has not been reviewed for its purpose and its composition for some time. So as you can see, we just added like four or five different topics that could very much fall under that. Um, so to do a little, you know, due diligence around what would be a committee that can really enact change in a meaningful way and to really spearhead some of these initiatives in collaboration with our health care providers. So the notion about whether we separate it from the grant, because in fact, it, we may not have a district nurse leader, right? We just don't know at this point because we don't know what the grant's going to look like. But really to offer someone an opportunity who has this skill set and this knowledge to come in maybe on a stipend basis to lead this committee work. Okay. Thank you. There's a lot on the topic. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that brings us to the food services update. I guess. So at the last meeting, I think Jess, you had, um, Jessica, you had suggested that um, Carl Carson join us tonight, and he is here okay. to Hello. address Hi. the committee. Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, just want to update you on some of the things we're doing at the lunch program. Uh, one other thing is um, farm to school update, uh, how we purchase um, our produce is we go through a state bid process and uh, we get a vendor and that vendor makes a pledge to purchase local produce um, as much as they can. Obviously Massachusetts uh, doesn't have a huge growing population of produce, uh, but we do buy what we can. Uh, local could include places like Connecticut or New York, um, New Hampshire, things like that. So. Um, we always get a list of what is local. Uh, currently, uh, we've, we had local cucumbers this year. Uh, the Macintosh apples that we're just now starting to get are local apples. Again, those come from different growers from the area. So, uh, tomatoes have been local uh, and squash, and we're currently doing uh, pears this year, which uh, fresh hand fruit we have every day in all of the schools. So, uh, we have posters that come from um, farm to school and we promote those parish to the students um, to get them. So, um, items we're looking for for next uh, month are uh, fresh greens, broccoli, cabbage, and potatoes. Uh, obviously, those are a bit later growing season uh, items. Um, I'm working with Chestnut Hill Farm um, to be able to set them up as a vendor so that we can purchase some items from them. Um, again, that, you know, we're looking at the greens, the broccoli, and the cabbage um, from them. So. Uh, they're busy right now with the farmers markets and things like that. So we're looking for a relationship with them. Uh, so again, you know, we're just trying to get as local as we can in South Row would be great. Just unfortunately, New England's growing season's really tight. Um, uh, you know, another thing I'm, I'm actually trying to do is, um, Clayton has a little bit of a grant and I'm trying to, yeah. <laughs> Um, I found a product that actually would allow us to grow produce in our classrooms. Um, it's a gr growing rack. It's, it's really, it's just, it's awesome. It, it, you know, it's four racks, there's lights, they're on timers, so the lights are on when the kids aren't in the room. Uh, the kids learn to compost because it's about 45 days you grow lettuce. And it's in such a system that you put the dirt in the ground or you know in a tray and you put a uh, plate on top and then you put it has holes in the plate so the kids space out the seeds properly and then you pull the plate off and you put more dirt on and then you use the plate to set the depth height and then there's a certain amount of water that they water and they have to keep track of it and then in 45 days you'll have greens um, baby lola rosa uh, swiss shard all kinds of neat things that you can do and 
then after 45 days, the product is harvested. Obviously, you know where it came from, and there's no pesticides. You know, it's grown indoors. You can watch it grow. And then once that is done, then you take the clippings, and then you take another pile of dirt, and then you put it in the dirt, and then you put um, uh, a product in it that comes from worms that helps break down the product, and then you take that other dirt that was in, that sat for 45 days, and then you start the whole process over again. So every 45 days you're getting uh, fresh produce. Um, you know, it's, it's a great program. The kids learn how to grow, the growing process. Um, you, you can do experiments. You can overwater one part, underwater another part, and see the different effects of weather, and, uh, you know, too much light, too little light. It's, it's pretty fascinating. So, you know, we're looking at that. I think once we get a foothold, that will grow rapidly. And you know, you know, another thing they said is, uh, you know, the presentation I saw was, you can grow, you put it, again, you use the same plates, but you put it in small to-go containers, and then you can start to grow the lettuce, and then you can sell it for a fundraiser. So people can take it home, grow lettuce at home, harvest it. So, you know, the kids, they get involved in their product that they, that they eat. They get to get excited about it, you know, tell their friends, hey, let's eat this fresh lettuce. I grew it in my class. So you know, we're looking at that. We're excited about that. Um, I am attending uh, the Keeping It Local conference at the John Stocker Institute in Framingham on October 23rd. And it just discusses incorporating agriculture and locally procured foods in our national school lunch program. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, they bring in some local farmers and they help us to understand what goes into the growing process so we get better knowledge of how to do it and give them our ideas and our input, what we can actually sell. <coughs> the Brussels sprouts are a real hard sell. You know, we've been doing squash this year. Um, you know, it doesn't sell as well as we'd like. You know, we try to season it up, put a little crushed tomatoes in it, fresh basil, try to do something a little exciting with it, but you know, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a hard sell, especially at the, at the younger grades, but we definitely keep trying it. Let them know that it's local, you know, it's fresh. Um, maple syrup. Maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> Brown sugar. <laughs> or, or, or breading. Yeah. Yeah. Fry it. Um, fry it. Yeah. Fry it. <laughs> well, we haven't had fry leaders for quite a few years. Um, another item we're looking at um, is an online menu program. Uh, we've looked at a couple. Uh, we're looking at another one. And this will. Like there are our menus I produce and then we put it online. And the trend is, you know, five years ago you didn't have it. Now, with technology being what it is, uh, the items, I would build a menu with the kind of preset items, but we could also customize it also, but it would have the menu items in there. And then when a parent or a student were to go online, they could look it up. And if they had a gluten allergy, they could check that box and it would cross off the items that had gluten. So it would customize it to what was available for those students. And then you could click on the item and then it's hyperlinked that has the nutritional piece, the sodium, the fat, the carbohydrates, and all those types of things. Um, it's a great service. There's more and more every year. Um, so we're looking at that. Uh, some of them are expensive. Some of them aren't so expensive. So we're trying to find the what's going to be the best for us. So we're looking to do that, hopefully by January. So that'll be exciting. Um, uh, you know, I'm always looking for feedback. Uh, one of the things um, I've been working with with RIT is uh, Google surveys. Um, it's new to me, but I've been playing around with it, um, working with my staff, um, trying to develop them. Uh, there's a lot more surveys, I think, with students now, with you know, the computers and the more and more we get into um, Chromebooks and things like that in the classroom. It's a, it's a quick way to get good surveys or get good information out of the students, make it quick. Um, I'm conducting uh, meetings with the PTOs um, to gather questions to use on these surveys. I want to find out what the questions they want to get from me, what's important to them so that I can extract that data drill that down um, you know we're always we want to always improve our menu we try different things at least once a month we try a new item uh, you know we find 
you know, like our tangerine chicken. You know, we tried it a couple years ago. It was a government commodity that we diverted to, and we got it. We tried it, and it kind of was flat. We tried it again, and it did a little bit better. And then we did some tastings, and now it's a fairly popular item. So we find that we have to try things several times. Um, you know, this month we're trying chicken Caesar salad. Um, I know, like my kids, you know, they're 15 and 12, really like it. You know, salads are a big thing now, so you know we can use government commodities in it, um, local produce if it's available, and just something different for the kids. And I think. I think, you know, it, it may take a couple of times, but we definitely were tracking it now, more of with our, you know, uh, point of sale system, I'm able to get the data quickly, and then we're really starting to try to like log that and see what worked, what didn't work, why it worked, why it didn't work. Um, you know, a couple of things like, uh, I'll give an example, is the tacos, you know, I, I um, my, you know, my manager is like, eh, it just doesn't go well here. I think the kids are a little bit younger. So we kind of just were playing with the idea. It's like, let's build your own taco. Let's get the kids involved into actually making it, putting it together, give them kind of an activity. And she said her account went up like over 20, I believe. So, you know, we're trying to do different things, have them build it, get them involved in that. And it sounds kind of cheesy, I guess. <laughs> Lack of a better word, but we're definitely trying to just get the kids involved in doing fun things like that. Um, uh, student focus groups. I met with the uh, green team last year at um, Steve School. Um, got some great ideas. They, you know, we we're on another topic, but you know, I figured, well, I got you here. What what we want? And, you know, you get the you get some crazy stuff. You know, you get the McDonald's hamburgers and the, um, the fish sticks. So we tried fish sticks for a little while, and you know, they did okay, but they just weren't really popular enough for us. But We'll see them from time to time. You know, we 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 figured out we can't just do it every month, so we're doing it maybe every other month. They can kids kind of get look forward to it. I think it's like a lot of things. You get a following for it, and then you get some kids who don't really care for it. But you know, on the other hand, we've really been trying to develop some different alternate lunches. So when we when we do the fish sticks, we can still capture the sales. Um, you know, we've really done that uh, at trottier and I think it's been going well you know we keep it fluid we're not really set in our ways because we listen to the kids and sometimes we try things and it goes well and then it starts to drop off we change it up you know or we move it from one day to another day and things like that so we're always constantly changing like that for the kids to what they want um, you know spicy chicken patty was great for us, you know, it was an alternate on Tuesdays and Wednesday, or Tuesdays and uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then it kind of just dropped off. So we changed one of the days to a regular chicken patty, and you know, once again, we see the sales pop back up. So again, we're always just trying to use the data. Um, and just the other day, we did 237 meals of trotty, which is the highest we've had in a long time. since I've been here. So you know, 200 was the mark. A while ago, and then now, you know, it was 210 was the mark. Now 220 was the mark, and now 237 was the mark. So we did. <laughs> We're definitely trying to do that. So, and then I'm looking to. I know uh, Green Team is becoming forming at Trotier, mm -hmm. so I'll be talking to them soon. You know, they have some other uh, topics they want to talk to me about. It's styrofoam. Obviously, we use. Uh, plastic when we can. Sometimes we need to use styrofoam if our dish machine is down or we have an issue or if the kids go to their classrooms, things like that. So, you know, we, we, we're going to talk to them about that, but while I have them there, I'm definitely going to pick their brains and see what they want. Um, again, you know, the, the menu planning is a interesting, complex, not fun or exciting. I showed Greg a big packet of it today. He's like, yeah, this is... <laughs> Uh, a lot of data. Um, let's see. Um, I'm wor working to set up some PTO coffee sessions. I had one uh, last year. Had some parents who had some concerns, so we met with them. Uh, was able to explain to them, you know, about an hour and a half, what we do, how we come up with the menus. And I think some people had some, you know, 
know, their eyes were opened a little bit. <coughs> how it happens, it's, it's complex. You know, we have a lot of regulations. Um, you know, the whole grain issue that we started in 2008, you know, the industry's caught up to it, made a better product, um, I believe, that we have now. Um, you know, using government commodities. You know, we divert some of our government commodities um, to some Tyson chicken products and to some cheese. And, you know, they, you know, if we don't divert, we get a lot of American cheese. But if we divert some <laughs> of our product, we can get shredded mozzarella or we can get um, the bread, you know, the uh, bread sticks with mozzarella and you know, the pizza dippers. So, you know, we try to do some different things with that because um, otherwise it would be just American cheese all the time. But then again, we like American cheese because we do the um, grilled cheese and tomato soup and it's huge. You know, and then, you know, we tried to do, you know, in the beginning of the year, we're like, oh, it's hot, you know, let's not do the soup. And boy, boy, did we hear about that, which is great. You know, I, we, we, you know, my, my managers are on the front line. They definitely uh, speak to the kids as they go through the line make sure that what they like, what they don't like. You know, I'm in all of the, every day I'm in a cafeteria serving or helping out, asking, talking to the kids. I love to hear what they like, what they like, what they don't like. Again, you know, it's, I can't do McDonald's, I can't do Big Mac. Mm -hmm. But we can do some other fun stuff. Um, you know, one of the questions was, is how do we make the menus? Uh, you know, we have to have, five components, um, it has to have a fruit, it has to have a vegetable, it has to have a grain, which is, has to be a whole grain rich, so it has to be 51% whole grain in, in all of our products. So even like our chicken nuggets, the breading on them is made with a whole grain breading. So five years ago, you didn't even see that in the grocery store. Now you're starting to see that in the grocery store. Tyson has decided that, hey, maybe there's a market for it outside because commercial market and retail are very different. So all of our products are made with lower sodium, lower fat. Um, you know, any of the snacks that we serve are on the John Stalker A-list. So in order for a snack to be on the A-list, it has to go through rigorous testing and it has to be only a certain amount of calories. It can't be above 210 calories. It has to have uh, lower sodium uh, and lower fat. So, again, the industry caught up to that uh, several years ago. So, uh, you know, you'll see the chips are either the baked or the RF on the bottom instead of saying reduced fat, which isn't as appealing to the kids, they put RF on it. So, kind of a little bit of marketing ploy, but it's one of those things that the industry has done to help us out to be able to still to compete and serve a healthier snack. Um, <coughs> Another component that has to have is a meat or meat alternate. So again, that's why the pizza, you know, it has a whole grain dough that, so like when we have the Sal's pizza, it's made for schools. It's a fresh, made that week product. It's whole grain. It, we use government commodity cheese that's on it. And again, their sauce is specially made. And it's a lower sodium sauce to meet the requirements for the government um, so it's actually it's pretty good and then we the, the milk so that's how we look at lunch is in components um, which sounds kind of odd but that's kind of how we do it um, and then it has to be a certain size so it has to be two portions um, so it has to be two ounces so that's why when you see when we do a chicken nugget the breading counts as a grain, but it's only one grain portion. So that's why we serve the dinner roll next to it. So the chicken nuggets and the dinner roll, that gives you your protein, your two uh, ounces of protein, and then your two grains. So with a fruit or vegetable, that's a complete reimbursable meal. So we always have uh, at least uh, one uh, fresh fruit every day at all the schools. We usually have more than that. I know today we had apples, pears, and bananas. So they're always available for the kids. And you know, again, it's the difference of the way we buy apples, we buy a certain size apple. So it's a 90 count to a case of apple. 
which meets our requirements. Because if it's too big of an apple, it's too big of a portion, and our costs go down. You know, our costs actually go up with that. So um, that's kind of you know where we are with that. Um, going off of a little bit of the um, the health and wellness, uh, one of the things like we have done is we worked with the nurses to get the allergen information to the schools as quickly as possible. So one of the things I do is in the very beginning is the nurses compile the data, it comes to us, we can enter it into our point of sale system, which is another great tool that we use because um, allergen is, is very important to us. So in order, how that works is when a student comes up to the line and put their number in, usually the screen just comes up and it has the student's name and it lets us know if they have money or, or not. And when the kid has an allergy, the first thing it pops up and it says allergic to whatever, or has celiac disease or lactose intolerant. And then you can't go past to complete the sale unless you actually acknowledge that. And then another uh, piece that we do is on each of the cafeterias, we have a, a little white chalkboard that we write on there so that if something is made in a facility that processes sesame seeds, we write that on there. That doesn't mean it contains sesame seeds. It doesn't mean that. But they like to let people know that there is a potential for that hazard. So we try to communicate that with the students. Um, and then we definitely, that data goes with the student throughout their entire career. So we're constantly updating that. Um, you know, some kids grow out of certain things. So, and it's not just that we can just wipe it off the list. We really have to have a doctor's note or parent's note says that my student is no longer in order for us to remove it. So we take that very seriously. Um, uh, we started meeting with the nurses uh, about once a year. Uh, and what came out of that is we actually did some uh, professional development together. Uh, talked about what is sanitation, um, what's disinfecting, things like that. Um, and you know, we definitely try to work with them so that we have that relationship. So when a new student comes in, they come down and say, "Hey, I got a new student. He's allergic to peanuts." So we're able to get that data in quickly. Uh, you know, we again take it very seriously. Um, started working with some of the school nurses, um, carb counts, you know, we're starting to see uh, diabetics come in where insulin is important, so she has like a quick count of the menu items and it's kind of in a nice little sheet so that it's quickly to add up what the meal is and be able to administer the insulin. So, you know, they work, they collaborate with that. Um, that's about kind of it. Has any questions or? Um, I have a quick question. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned that Chestnut Hill Farm had some other farm to school updates. I'm just wondering how those kind of things have they been implemented yet? What the cost and you know and again you know how we how what the plan is to transition to maybe more of these packaged meals, these like fresh produce. And I think one of the things for me getting the update for. Uh, the school lunches is that I've heard from a lot of parents uh, concerns about, and you know, we I, I think I was part of that group of folks who mm -hmm. had um, concerns, you know, about well, I don't want my child eating a mozzarella stick for their lunch, even though it comes with all these other components that are right. part of the required thing. So I'm just wondering how, what kind of changes would be needed to go, in, or are we already doing these, like farm to? Well, we're already doing the farm to school. We've been actually doing it uh, for quite a few years. Um, again, it's really, it's tough to plan on, I'm going to get cucumbers because of the way purchasing is done at the produce companies purchasing. You know, there isn't a lot of that produce available on a regular basis. So they buy what they can because it does save them money because it's not transported from California. You know, like now our lettuce is coming out for Arizona because that's as close as we can get romaine lettuce. So if they can get romaine that's closer, it doesn't travel so far, so it's cheaper for them. They let us know what we have, and then we specify 
we'll take the local Macintosh atlas. Um, I think we could probably do a better job of letting folks know that. So I'll definitely get that where it came from and get that in some type of like a little newsletter so that can go out with the backpack so people can understand that. I mean, I think that would be helpful given the, some of the parent, and I think there's a parent group out there somewhere that's interested in either like the, having a garden at the school or right. doing something. So having that information be communicated out to right. the parents, I think would be helpful. Um, I know you've heard or seen similar things. Mm -hmm. yeah, gardens are tough. It's like I grow a garden at home and it's the same thing. You know, you get it in the ground and you watch it and then school's out and then just before school starts you start getting tomatoes and you pull a couple peppers and you know life is good and then school starts and then you don't have I know I personally don't have much left because of <laughs> the way my garden is but um, we're definitely uh, you know like I said with I know that grant I'm trying to trying to get a piece of that action <laughs> um, but I just think I think it's great that we can get produce year round but anyway I digress um, you know the prepackaged meals you know unfortunately you know, in doing the studies, that's what kids like. They like the, the chicken nuggets, and they like the hamburgers, and we get a lot of government commodity hamburger. So we definitely try to make our own uh, spaghetti and meat sauce, or pasta and meat sauce, and that type of thing. And that's why we use a lot of the tacos, um, because we use the government commodity you know, beef. Uh, again, that's why we're trying to, at least once a month, do something different, um, like the chicken Caesar salad try to do something fresh that we control, that we do in-house. So we're definitely <coughs> working on that constantly and, you know, using the, my kitchen manager's input for that. Because again, they, you know, they're more on the front lines. They talk to the kids. They can see what is in there. You know, one of the things I always do too, you know, the custodial staff kind of looks at me some, sometimes is when the kids are done eating, I like to go see what they're throwing away. Because if they're throwing it away, why would I serve it? You know, waste their money on it. So I definitely do that. Do that and look for trays, because kids like to throw the trays away. Um, so, you know, that's a constant focus of ours. You know, we're always looking to do different things. Hopefully we can, you know, when the broccoli comes in, we'll do either a stir fry or a nice steam and put something on it for the kids. Or, you know, maybe just let them have it raw and put a little, ranch, you know, low fat, low sodium ranch dipping sauce on it. You know, we're going to try to do some different things like that. So, I have a couple questions. So, sure. the, um, I love the idea of if, I don't know if it was the grant that was with Clayton or a different grant, I love the idea of them growing something in the classroom because I know with my own picky eaters, the way that I got them to eat vegetables was growing it in our garden. Right. That's now they, one of the only vegetables they eat are fresh green beans because they've been growing them since they were little kids and they mm -hmm. love picking them and, you know, they, they love that. So. I love that idea, and I know kids are super picky. I mean, my kids never buy lunch except for pizza dipper day and <laughs> chicken nugget day, and that's it. So because they're picky eaters, mm -hmm. but I would love to see. You know, I love the idea of the growing the food in the classrooms, especially at the younger age, because as we all know, if you get them at a young age, then maybe they will try that. You know, stir fry or whatever, because they're being exposed to. It. So I would love to see some sort of collaboration with food services and like the younger grades school like the classrooms mm -hmm. to really start exposing kids to different things when they're really young so then they're more open to it as they get older and I, I always remember Paul saying to me like his daughter eats broccoli only because they had it at school with ranch dip mm -hmm. and that's the and other kids were eating it so she ate it too and it's like you get them young we can get them eating more of those interesting meals and the fresh stuff from the farm and all that. So I would love to see something like that. And then the other thing, this question comes up all the time with parents and I'm still not sure of the answer. Are the portions the same size for like a kid in kindergarten and a kid in middle school? Um, yes and no. So like if you have it goes by calorie count, and that's actually one of the not exciting charts that I had before that I will definitely get to you, um, this packet. Uh, but like your portion of fruit or vegetable will be uh, four ounces. So if you have, say, K 
canned peaches, it's four ounces for all of those grades. Now when you start getting into the eighth grade, they can start taking two and they can increase those amounts that they eat because their calorie count goes up. So when we do, say like a portion of spaghetti, we do a larger portion of pasta and meat sauce for the, for older, the older kids because then we have to start getting our calorie count up. Okay, so it goes by calorie count. And for it's grade level specific. Okay. I know it's like probably a very boring chart, but could I get that maybe? Sure. Because that is one of the most common questions I get from parents. I have one here tonight I can give you. All right, cool. Because mm -hmm. I'd Putting love it to on the website too would probably be yeah, which a yeah. good idea. Well, we'll I, I'll get this up there. That would be one of the, the, you know, communicating to the parents. Like all this stuff that you're telling us is awesome and I love hearing all of it. And just even like a monthly update in the Thursday packs and the yeah. Friday. Um, I know it's harder at the middle school level because, <clears throat> I mean, I know as a parent, I forget to check the, the, the updates at the middle school level because there's no more reminders coming, like the Thursday pack gets out or the, you know, the, <clears throat> the Friday information is out, but just like getting that out to the parents would be awesome because it just shows all this great work that you're doing that they don't know about. Okay, I will definitely do that. We'll put that up on the website. I had a few questions too. Sure. First, back to the growing stuff in the classrooms. Were you talking about growing stuff for use in in the cafeteria? Is we it, can we can do that. Is it? I mean, I don't know how big these things are. They can walk. Is it enough to make a dent in what you need? It's not necessarily that it would make a dent. You're not going to subsidize buying produce, but the idea is to get the kids excited about it, and then that mix will go into a toss salad so that they would be able to see what they grew yep. and eat it. Because one of the things that's very specific that we do in order for me to get credit for selling a leafy vegetable or a green, dark green vegetable, I can't serve uh, iceberg lettuce. It doesn't have enough nutritional value on it. So to me, it doesn't benefit me to serve it. A, it's got no flavor, it has no nutrition, so that's why whenever we make anything, we use romaine lettuce, because romaine is a credible portion for us. It counts as a green leafy vegetable. <coughs> so when we do a tossed salad, we use romaine. Mm -hmm. So if we were growing our own, we would do a tossed salad and we would take these other lettuces that they would do, incorporate that into our romaine, then it would still be a credible portion for us. Okay. And um, <coughs> I guess it was late last year, I think, we. Uh, Increase prices for yes all cafeteria stuff, and I'm just wondering what kind of difference that's made, if any, on sales. Uh, so far, it's making a positive impact. You know, we we budgeted. Uh, you know, we have a very strict budget. We really started drilling down everything on that. We get very granular to even adult a la carte meals. We started really tracking all that. So we have a large spreadsheet that we're putting all this in, and we're just really keeping an eye on it. And it's definitely more on budget so far for the first month as of now. So, but I mean, are you selling more or less than before the prices went up? Uh, I think we're, well, I shouldn't say I think. I know we're doing a little bit better than what we were last year. Again, we're really trying to increase our participation by changing things, yep. offering more choices for the kids. So that is making an impact. And definitely the, you know, the meals are getting. Well, that was purchased. That was my next question. So what, what changes have have we seen for the menu as a result of the prices going up? Uh, I, usually in past experiences, I, I believe we usually see a, a decrease in meals participation, but this year our, our participation has grown a little bit this year, because again, we're trying to be aggressive as we can as to offer new choices and different things for the students. That's more what I'm talking to about. Keep like, yeah. Is it giving you money to try new things and if so? Um, not as of yet, but it's you know we're only one month in for us. But as we track it, we're hoping to be able to have some money so that we can start purchasing growing racks and a few other things, some new pieces of equipment that we could use a little bit here and there too. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Well, thanks for coming. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks. It's good to hear all that. And that brings us to the superintendent's report to the committee. Enrollment.
enrollments are in your packet, no significant change from last month. Obviously, we are looking very closely at these and have rolled the numbers forward as we begin our budget conversations in terms of class sizes and so forth. Uh, big uh, point of conversation when you're building a new budget, right? Do we need teachers? Do we not? And in South Pro, uh, we, we appear to be fairly stagnant, and that's positive uh, term. In other words, we're not seeing any declines. So, for the most part, even projecting our numbers forward, we're not anticipating any class size changes at all in terms of staffing. So, I think uh, we're going to hold steady as we build our FY20 budget in terms of classes, class size, and obviously then the teachers in those classes. I, I will say that a lot of our conversation has been around the needs of students in the preschool level. So, we're focusing on those conversations right now as well. Is Toronto around 4.30, is that, is that a charge, right? Yeah, that's right. So 55% of the kids their lunch. That's right. Yeah. Wow. High percentage, that's about as high percentage we've had in a while. Me, it? it is. It is. I remember at times it was as low as 20. <coughs> Yeah. Somebody's, somebody's got to beat it. Yeah. We're, we're having a contest. We can have the greatest <laughs> percentage. Pizza <laughs> dippers. Also, <laughs> also in the packet is the expenditure report. It's early on in the expending of a new fiscal year. Uh, we need a vote to approve until audited. In fact, our auditors were due in last week and we moved them forward a little bit. Um, I would say that our special ed is a little bit more favorable this year in terms of what's in our circuit breaker balance because we had a little bit of an upside, an uptick with the circuit breaker mm -hmm. increased 72%, which was nice. And uh, according to today's conversation, it looks like we're tracking that way um, for FY20 as well. So that's good news. So we just need to vote to approve until audited. Small move to approve the fiscal year 19 monthly general fund expense Expense report as of September 30th, 2018. I second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? <coughs> it's unanimous. And the capital plan conversation, it is timely. Um, we do know that our financial advisory in South Pro has been looking forward to our capital plan presentation subcommittee met. Um, I want to say at the beginning of September looked at this in draft form. Since then, we've made minor tweaks. Um, Brian um, Fantoni is here this evening, and he's been patiently waiting over there on his first uh, presentation to the school committee. Yes. Um, we did agree that I'd do a little intro to this plan. Uh, that is to say what the color coding is about. We added that to our capital plan this year based on the work that we have done uh, at the Woodward project moving forward and the great conversation and collaboration we've had with the town. So we wanted to identify purposely that those items that are in orange are kinds of uh, projects that we hope we're going to be able to time um, such that when the town is doing some paving or uh, you know some construction work, they're right next door, similar to the Deerfoot path that we're gonna talk about a little bit um, later on in this presentation. We've had some conversations with Karen and with Mark Purple, and we all agree that that would be a, a perfect marriage of when they're doing the work, um, our work gets done. And so that worked really well for Woodward because we piggybacked on Karen Galligan's pricing for, for asphalt for the Main Street project and then some of the Woodward work. So that's a conversation I think we want to have with uh, financial advisors just to let them know that we're mindful of the importance of working with the town and while some things might be in, you know, FY22, if they're in our backyard and they're patching, well, we'll want to be involved in that conversation. So to let them know we're here, these are projects, please reach out to us as well as we will reach out to them. The green is uh, the rec department's uh, conversations about warrant articles to improve the field. So again, just noting that it's not just the school, it's collaboration of, of other town boards as well. The blue, uh, projects that uh, potentially could be warrant articles moving forward, which was the big concern of financial advisory. What are you looking at that's big, uh, big projects over the next 10 years? 
And so Brian is doing a great job with a consultant trying to um, get some updated prices. We've been carrying these same prices forward for a number of years. They have to go up. They very rarely go down. So we're trying to get some you know, more current pricing. I will share with you an interesting conversation that took place um, apparently either with planning board or with the board of selectmen, uh, which Mark Purple shared with me yesterday, which might have some impact on our capital plan. And that is they too are looking at long range planning and they too are having conversations about what might happen 10 years from now. And so some of that suggests that the projects that we have identified for five years from now or four years from now, uh, we may want not to do them or put them on hold. Uh, one such conversation that's taking place is um, the debt rolls off of the Woodward School in FY24. It is in close proximity to the public facility safety building and there is some conversation about turning Woodward into a municipal building and should we look at Finn again in terms of a complete overhaul because we know that Finn, if we touch it, has some significant upgrades that need to be made. That was a new conversation for us. Um, we did suggest that they really need to have us involved in that conversation at the infancy, but that to project out 10 years, um, you know, we have a, sometimes a challenging, um, a challenge just projecting kindergarten out two years. So, you know, to suggest that we're in a position to talk about whether we need one school or, a, a, you know, emerging of a K-8 or a, a K-5 is really a very long range conversation that needs a lot of in-depth research and, and dialogue. The closest we've ever come to that kind of analysis is sort of every six years we dust off um, and change and update the numbers in terms of um, the years. <coughs> discussion. So um, I just share that because it, it just sort of dropped into my office yesterday. Who, who was discussing this? Mark Purple. Town it, 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 with advisory? one of the boards in town. I'm not sure just if it was um, planning board or was um, uh, financial advisory, but he did want me to know that that came up in a long range planning conversation and so we don't want to be sort of taken aback by not knowing that this is something that they might be talking about. So I'm curious, talk about the blue, you said they want to know about anything big. Do they define big as big like over half or over, I don't know, I mean. We, we sort of defined it for them. I think our big is over like 150 50. in okay. this model. Okay. So okay. here we have, yeah. you know, a conversation about boilers at Finn. Um, that's an important conversation to have. But it's also very important for us to be mindful that these are projects that we're looking at because MSBA from now, sometimes, um, without much notice, decides that it's going to fund something uh, for um, replacement that it may not have funded a couple years ago. So perfect example. Uh, boiler conversation, not in this district, but in another district. Um, it was stated <coughs> that MSBA wasn't touching boilers, no replacements, no upgrades. What's MSBA? Uh, Massachusetts School Business Authority, okay. which actually partners with communities to give a significant reduction in cost in terms of um, grant dollars. Um, the Woodward School, most of the schools are built through Massachusetts School Business Authority dollars. And if anybody's mm -hmm. out there planning a new building, the biggest concern is how much is MSBA going to give us in reimbursement. Likewise, um, with, with, with the Woodward discussion, you basically are hands off a building as long as you're paying back the debt to MSBA. And that's why the conversation I mentioned that's taking place perhaps around Woodward School has everything to do with the debt coming offline and MSBA sort of releasing authority over any of our buildings because that date has passed. And what date is that for Woodward? 2024. Like the end, the end of that school year? The end of the or? debt, yeah, in sometime in that year. So every building, every school building that's been built, and usually any significant upgrade to a building has involved, hopefully, some MSBA reimbursement funds. So as we look at these big projects, um, what they fund and what they choose to fund in any given year changes. So a good example, 
um, much like Finn, we had a boiler in a school. We're at, we were out of duct tape. There was absolutely no, no loose screws anywhere that we could put in, that fit into this boiler. Um, it hadn't been produced for years. Um, we, we came to learn or know that MSBA was funding boilers now, which they hadn't done in the past. Uh, but it had to be within sort of a date window. So if it had been installed six months before, that $350,000 warrant article may have been eligible for some reimbursement. So I mention that because we know we've got some sizable projects. So always be mindful and watchful over what MSBA is going to fund because they reauthorize money, <coughs> reimbursement money, at their discretion. So we know we have some big projects. So if they were to all of a sudden say, we're going to give you 90% or 85% reimbursement on boilers, and it was, you know, it fit into their window and their criteria, we might want to pull that project in. Um, so we're getting some new prices, but, you know, if those kinds of conversations are taking place, whether they're either just, you know, sort of a, a flash in the pan or there's great uh, focus dialogue around those kinds of things happening, you know, we're looking at some sizable, sizable projects in some of our schools that are five or six years out. Do we want to do that or do we want to be, you know, appropriate wait time and wait to see where these conversations go? I think they're very much in the infancy, but it's important to know that those are out there in case you hear they're going to, you know, we're going to turn over Woodward in 2024. So how would they have the authority to, how would the town have the authority to turn over Woodward? Well, there would be lots of conversations around yeah. that, but they're basically public, you know, they're school buildings, but the town does have some uh, jurisdiction jurisdiction and ownership around the use of the facilities. I think it's a shared conversation. Obviously, they fall under the auspices of the school committee, but it would be a, a discussion that would be yeah. at the town level and at the school level. I would it's love a ways to talk, away. Yeah, I would love to learn more about this yeah. offline because that... That's a little concerning to me, so, so I would want to keep a wary eye on what's going on. Yeah. Who, it's who has authority over well, yeah, that's who has a, ownership. That's a different issue, right. but as far as the property ownership, it's the town. Um, so I know you're going to the conference too uh, this uh, in November. They yeah. also have some workshops around this conversation and discussion. MASC oftentimes offers some. We can have an offline conversation. Yeah, and it, I don't want to have a chicken little, pro, you know, discussion. It's just something that came to me yesterday that it was out there with one of the town boards. And as we know, oftentimes, um, no, sometimes it's like the doors are going to close tomorrow in our schools, and that's not it. It's just something to be mindful of that it's you know it's it took place someplace, and um, with that in mind, where it goes. You know, it's, it's too much in its infancy, but it could change our capital plan, you know, d some, some time down the road. Um, and you mentioned keeping an eye on what MSBA is funding. How do we do that? Through, generally, we get updates through the superintendent's office. Okay. Um, they oftentimes um, issue um, commissioner updates. Um, it is isn't beyond the scope of what we do to sort of check in with them. You know, they, they um, check in with us, particularly if we have projects that are funded through them. Uh, we just did a significant renovation on another one of our schools. And so um, we've had a lot of recent interaction with them. So they often do memorandums. And um, in this case, if there's something that we're looking at long term, we usually check in and see what their status is on their projects. <coughs> Um, also on, on this, you'll note that in FY20 and 21, we do have some security upgrades planned. Uh, we were very fortunate that because of, um, you know, good fiscal practices, uh, particularly um, when we were moving forward with the telecommunication systems, we seize the opportunities um, when they present themselves, either in the revolving account, the facilities rental, or in the operational budget to pull some of these projects in. Um, 
again, there's security upgrades, there are kinds of things that we've been talking about at different forums and so forth, continuing to enhance um, school security, whether it's cameras or locks or those kinds of things. So we have those budgeted in the next two years, 20 and 21, in all of our schools. Um, we're hoping that we can move forward with some of these this year, depending on what our revenue is, is looking like as we progress through the year. Brian, did I finish my part? <laughs> I've a lot of money. So. Yeah. I told you I had the option. You did, you did. So the uh, rest is yours. All right. <laughs> so I just want to start a little bit with um, some things that we have been doing and have completed. Um, well, we recently completed an upgrade to the telephone systems in all the buildings, um, as well as working closely with the town, specifically John Parent, uh, through the Green Communities Act. Um, we did a lot of air sealing in the buildings, which is uh, doing things like uh, uh, checking to make sure the exterior doors are functioning properly, installing door sweeps, weather stripping, um, sealing around our rooftop, air handlers, that type of thing, uh, roof wall joints, just basically finding all the drafty areas in the buildings and and that should, that should help a lot with the uh, efficiency of the heating and cooling. Um, and that was free? And that was no yeah, cost all done through, through the Green Communities Act. It, it didn't cost the town or the schools anything. Great. Um, and that's something we're going to continue to afford, uh, continue to do with the town. Uh, it looks like right now, maybe in every other year type of thing. Get me lost because you took half of those Sorry, <laughs> I was just Sorry. trying to help you out, Brian. Uh, you did. A, you did a wonderful job. <laughs> um, uh, also, like Christine said, I am working with some consultants um, on, on some of these larger uh, budget items. Uh, we're looking into roofing and boilers. Um, just trying to see um, the conditions of these systems right now, the longevity of them, and, and the course of action for later down the road. said the, the, a lot of our driveways are, are coming up in need of repair, so that's something we'll be collaborating with the towns to try to piggyback on any projects they might have. Um, <coughs> we've also been working on the maintenance plan, which will cover more every year. Uh, maintenance to the buildings is, is as far as just general upkeep, painting, carpeting, and that type of thing. Um, you know, some of the items on there, actually the carpeting in this room, um, just painting of classrooms, um, purchasing and upgrading equipment that we use every day to keep the buildings you know, looking the way they do. <coughs> Some questions on the Deerfoot Road. So, in talking with Karen Galligan, we're hoping early November, depending on weather, the plan would be to redo the part of the path that comes from Deerfoot Road down to the fork where the path from Mary meets the path that continues on to Tradia. So, we do down from the street down to that path dig it up, gravel, asphalt it, um, as well as a few areas that have some root damage right now, so paving back over that, getting that surface back where it needs to be, um, as well as the path across the fields over at Mary, um, removing the asphalt from that part of the path and lowing it and seeding it so it would be more natural to the fields surrounding it. Flight call in the heating systems in the buildings <coughs> uh, was brought up. So we are working closely with our HVAC company, William F. Lynch, and Gurney Engineering, testing the systems. Um, right now, the chiller loops at Trottier and Woodward are the um, main priority, as we've had some leaks in those systems, so we don't have um, adequate freeze protection in those loops. So we're working with them to add 
deleted glycol to the systems to get those where they need to be, as well as coming up with a plan for the remaining systems in the schools. Um, you know, mostly Trotty or the heating system needs some work here. Um, that's something we're just going to manage over the winter and readdress that in the spring. That pretty much covers what Christine didn't cover. If anybody has any questions? <laughs> Can you can you say repeat the Deerfoot Road the path again because that's something that mm. a few people have been asking right. about. So, so it's are, are you familiar with the path at all? I have there? walked it's, it, okay, but I've well, heard lots about it. <laughs> if you leave Trotier, yeah. there's a fork. So part of the fork goes to Mary, yeah, and the other fork goes to Deerfoot Road. Um, that's been the major concern okay. is the Deerfoot Road part of the path. So the path once you actually connect. Coming to Trotter is fine, so we're going to excavate from Deerfoot Road okay. down to where that path meets, lay new asphalt, and okay. then there's a couple areas of patchwork heading towards Neary to just, okay. just cover those Got routes. It. And then again, they were going to work from the Neary side and just kind of make that more of a natural yeah. setting. Yeah, okay, great. I just have this was Brian's <coughs> first presentation, and he has done an amazing job in the year that he's been in the role of interim manager, um, facilities manager, and especially with all the projects that we had going on this summer with the telecommunications and the Woodward project. I think Ryan is pretty much on 24-hour call uh, by the OPM on site. Uh, last week, we had an excellent tour of the sewers, Brian, I think it was. <laughs> A lot of high points. Um, <laughs> there was a rumor that the flagpole was sinking. That is not true. Um, we've had um, surprise visits by uh, a lot of folks, right, Steve, where they yes. wanted to um, connect into Woodward for one reason or another. Yep. Um, very high piles of rock uh, chipping left and right. Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of exciting visits to the Woodward project, and Brian has done an amazing job sort of fielding all of those questions. I don't think we expected that we would have that much work um, on our end to support their work on the other side of the fence and um, just has handled themselves very well in terms of response and just being there to make sure that our school and our students are safe mm -hmm. along with um, you know Principal Mochi. So it's been a busy year with the projects that we've had. And then we had the humps, and the, not the bumps, but the humps <laughs> installed. Um, still some more work. And um, I think his uh, collaboration and coordination with the staff uh, has been phenomenal. Um, the building principals can speak more directly to mm -hmm. the conversations that they've had. Brian's been incredibly responsible. Um, you know, taking on the custodial team is, is a challenge. And um, you know, clearly, everyone's working well together here at Trottier. You know, building the floors are spotless. Uh, I don't think there's been, they haven't missed too much of a beat. So, we've said to, I've said to Brian tonight, maybe your last night with the word interim in front, <laughs> <laughs> your first presentation uh, to the school committee tonight. So, I don't know if the principals want to add anything as well. well I know I would 100% support uh, those sentiments by you, Superintendent Johnson. Um, Brian jumped right in and, and yeah. took on all the projects that were pending for me, uh, took that load off of me, and I assume uh, put that responsibility on him, and he delivered on every one, even over the summer. You know, when things can kind of get a little helter skelter, uh, skelter he uh, buckled down and got the job done. And we've continued to meet daily about progress, and he updates me frequently. I don't have to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. He's given me the information. And for us, I know that isn't always the case. We have to remember to ask some of these questions, but not with Brian at the, at the control. So... I have a lot of confidence in mm -hmm. his ability moving forward to take care of all the stuff at Toronto, that's for sure. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I agree Very as well. I, I'm excited that Brian had his roots at Finn. Yeah, Algonquin and grad. <laughs> his, his perspective in a micro sense is now blossomed to the macro sense mm -hmm. and looking at the district in a way that not many people can develop that perspective because he's been essentially at every school at some point in time and he knows the schools intimately so I'm thrilled and I'm so excited that you know, and I'm so confident that he is at the helm uh, for this so yeah. I would just speak I would just speak to two um, 
two points. The first being uh, Brian's uh, work with the Woodward or with the um, with the school safety. Not school safety. We'll have a safe school. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the public safety building next to Woodward. While I'm included on every correspondence, very rarely do I have to interject. Uh, Brian's on top of that. He's he's one that's acting as um, um, kind of a middleman or one representing the school um, and the district in, in a way that I would never question. I mean, it's I rely on him to have those answers and to organize staffing um, when they do need to tap in power on holidays <coughs> or on the weekend. So um, thank you for that work, Brian. And then the um, the work that was done over the summer, um, the initial thought was that we would be having our driveway project done over the summer. Um, and in preparation for that, <coughs> Brian organized all of the personnel and um, <coughs> cleaning projects to and maintenance projects to take place early on. Um, our school was back to um, its original form, or if not better, sparkling um, within a few weeks of the end of the school year, you know, to so really allow teachers to come in and, and prepare for the school year. And he started, his launch was the power outage that we had last year for about three or four <laughs> days, so oh, it was a good start and he just kept going. Trial by fire. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask if you had any criticisms, but that's not going to go for <laughs> she to let Christine take half your presentation. She's the boss. <laughs> yeah, he still had, Brian was a former student of mine too, so it's really challenging. Right. He started to just call me by my first well, name recently. Well, Roger, <laughs> I, mean, I, can't can't you know, I sat in many of these chairs myself. <laughs> but Roger, one thing I could speak yeah. to that is say that every time Brian hasn't known the answer to a question, he hasn't assumed or interjected that he did. He went and found the answer. So he might not have all the answers at the immediate turn because of the systems that are involved, but he won't, he's not afraid to say, I have no idea and I've got to find it out. So granted, it's a backdoor criticism, but that's I would really, say that's, yeah. that's really a that, that's, that is a positive yeah, really way of handling a lot of situations that are dealt because he doesn't know what's going to happen on any given day. Yeah. It be very unusual. And his communication skills are so strong, he won't make a decision in isolation. Yeah. He comes and he, he problem solves with us looks for solutions so it's really a team effort and Mary has never looked better it Brian was key in helping us to hire our new head custodian as well as our second shift custodian and really worked collaboratively with them to uh, really <coughs> do such a tremendous work at Mary and mm -hmm. elsewhere as well but thank you thank you you should come every month. Seriously. <laughs> well, the last month, they're not even just saying this because you're here. Last mm -hmm. month, they all sung your praises and all That's their true. updates. Good like, to hear. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, thank you. Everybody's a big fan. All right. No other questions? Right. You're good. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Past my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> speak for some others, too. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, that uh, brings us to the fiscal 20 you, budget yeah. priorities, which we need to vote on. Right. Good one. Don't think we need any change from the last one, because um, I think the conversation pretty much was covered in most of the directions that we were going to vote. And kindergarten is still on there. We didn't really vote it. We just discussed it. Right? We discussed it. Right? No, but you, we're you do have to vote this month, yep. Yes. Now, I'll move we accept what's presented here um, as the uh, 2020 South Coast School Committee budget priorities. Should I read them or should I just say as, as presented? Well, I bet time. everybody would be happy with that as presented. <laughs> yeah, I, think so. I think that's just fine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a second? A second. Second by Jen. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Budget development. <coughs> what is budget development? Oh, we had that conversation. Okay. I sort of launched into that when we were talking about kindergarten and some of the other initiatives. It's where we are, and hopefully, definitely December, we'll have a preliminary, if not maybe before. Okay. Budget calendar then. Uh, no, no changes from last month. I think we're still sort of tracking this dual, dual course of towns, and towns dates versus our dates. But I think if we get close to December, we ought to be fine with our dates and their dates. Yeah. Because I think it's still evolving. Okay. We will have another budget subcommittee meeting prior to the presentation on the preliminary. 
So we're, whenever we start getting close to, to those numbers, we'll have a budget subcommittee. Okay. Then uh, educational policy, not at this time, apparently. Policy development, we have first readings on three policies. They're in the packet. So normally what we do here is uh, first reading, just read it if you have any suggested <coughs> changes. But, uh, so the uh, policy conflict. subcommittee meeting is um, October 29th. So okay. any feedback, we can discuss it at the, the subcommittee meeting. <coughs> Good. Um, personnel items. Personnel reports in the packet. <coughs> Mrs. Burgess is retiring. Yeah. She is. <laughs> that was the one that jumped out at me. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right, and communications. Few things in the packet. Mm. We did. I did include the preschool program brochure. I don't think the committee has actually seen the brochure before. We did make some um, upgrades this year, updates this year. Uh, we Dayton, um, streamlined the tuition Stream process the and added some sections. Programming itself yep. to account for what the parents really wanted in terms of programming. So we did away with some of the piecemeal programming and kind of kind of <coughs> solidified more four and five day programming and then we did some studies on area uh, districts for yeah. tuition uh, but that, positive changes yeah. too in that because I do see an uptick in the uh, preschool revolving uh, funds Interesting. so there's no more three day program mm -hmm. for typical students no right for general yeah, for general. yeah, that's, that's good. Right. And action on minutes from the September 12th meeting. Revised minutes. Um, Paul, you sent some suggestions for edits. Uh, were handed out, so they should be underneath the vanilla envelope. Yep. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing terribly. Exciting name spellings and right. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We looked at that three times and we said, "What? What? Does Paul doesn't want random?" <laughs> Didn't even dawn on us. It was well, a if spelling. You're gonna name something after that. You probably spell it. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was Cheryl and I both think, like, "What does Paul mean? He doesn't want Randall in there. He wants Mr. James." It took us a while to figure it out. I said, "Finally, just call Paul. It's spelled wrong." Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Do we have a motion on the minutes? A motion that we approve the minutes from the Wednesday, September 12th, 2018, South Dakota School Committee Open Meeting. As amended? As amended. Very good. Second. Second by Roger. Any discussion? All in favor? And that's unanimous. Bills and payrolls are right here. Mm -hmm. And agenda items for next month. Definitely budget conversations. Uh, that's we sort of planned our school improvement plans not only because the, the uh, remaining plans are mostly updates and you want to have time to update them with the year, but I think November and December are going to be budget discussion months. Do we? So the budget, because I'm new to all this. So when we have our budget discussion. You know, I'm not on the budget subcommittee, so mm -hmm. is that where I'm going to learn everything I need to know? Should I go to a budget subcommittee meeting? Okay. Yeah, I think okay. that would be great. <coughs> Even okay. though you're you're not um, an identified liaison, they're open to everyone, okay. and it's really a, a great opportunity to have some more granular conversation and really gain an appreciation for how the budget is sort of moves forward. Okay. So I think that would be awesome. Is it scheduled <coughs> yet? The next is this next budget subcommittee. It hasn't been scheduled. scheduled okay. It'll be somewhere between November first and Thanksgiving. Okay. okay. Well, if you have any other ideas for agenda items, just let me know. Greg, M MCAS. MCAS update. On MCAS uh, results. That brings us to audience sharing once again. Dave, hi. Anyone? Anyone. <laughs> Dave? 
<laughs> I guess there being none, we can entertain a motion to adjourn. Just, there is a combined meeting, October 22nd, I think. Is that what we finally decided? I think that's what it was, that Monday. The Monday? Yes, Monday. Okay. We'll send a reminder out to everybody. But it's definitely better. Okay. And we definitely already have quorums if everyone arrives. Good. Motion to adjourn, anyone? I'm going to adjourn. I have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay,